Good evening. The San Dimas City Council meeting will come to order. We had a, a closed session. It's from 6 to 7. Could I have a report on the uh, closed session? Uh, yes, thank you, Mayor. City Council met in closed session to discuss the one item <coughs> of labor negotiations on the closed session agenda. Council uh, did not complete its discussion on that item, and so we'll be returning to that at the end of the meeting tonight. Thank you. Please rise for the flag salute. Please repeat after me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We'll go into oral communications. Members of the audience are invited to address the City Council on any item on this agenda or not on this agenda. Public comment will be taken, will not be taken during each individual item except for public hearing items. Comments on public hearing items will be heard when that item is scheduled for discussion. Under the provisions of the Brown Act, the legislative body is prohibited from engaging in discussions on any item not appearing on the posted agenda. However, your concerns may be referred to the staff or set for discussion at a later date. Each speaker will be limited to three minutes. Henry, no? First. Henry? Okay. Henry? Good evening, Honorable Mayor members of the city council, staff, uh, members of the public. Uh, tonight, I would just like to um, celebrate an end of a remarkable career. Um, someone who has been a great asset to our great uh, city and a great ambassador. Um, this is our building official, Eric Beilstein. Um, since I started in 2019, I've witnessed personally how much Eric is valued, not only as our building official, but also as a team member and a, a friend. Um, Eric was one of the first people who, to greet me on my first day, and he has a great knack for making people feel at ease and welcome. Um, he gave me a tour of the city, and he has a wealth of knowledge on all parts of the city. And uh, in his 33 years of service, uh, Eric has been a major part of development projects and transition for the city that will ever forever change uh, the city's landscape, such as the transition from paper permits to electronic building permits, the development of the Target Shopping Center, uh, development of the Costco Shopping Center, uh, redevelopment of the Ace Hardware and Monta Vista Senior Apartments, uh, the Albertsons construction and remodel of the existing multi-tenant buildings, uh, the City Hall renovation. He actually has his name, and I believe he's the last uh, active city staff that uh, participated in that, uh, as well as the Brandywine and Brasada developments, just to name a few. Um, on behalf of the city and myself, Eric, uh, you will be sorely missed um, and irreplaceable, especially for your historical knowledge and your caring leadership. Um, I wanted to thank you, Eric, for your dedication and contributions in making our city great. And I wanted to wish you and your family a uh, well-deserved and happy retirement. Please, everyone, stand for Eric Austin. Well, for once, I did not prepare a speech, which I'm sure most of you, uh, after the other day, uh, appreciate. Um, you know, the faces have changed on council, the faces have changed at staff, but the mission has stayed the same. Uh, it is a place, San Dimas is a special place, it is a place, not only have I spent my career of 33 years, but it's also my home. Um, and you will be missed. Um, it will always be my home. I will uh, look fondly from Texas uh, to uh, 
to keep track of uh, what's happening here because, uh, again, you're my friends, you're my colleagues, and it's a special place. I just appreciate all you've done, all you've done for the city. Thank you so much. Would, would anyone from the council like to say a few words? Sure, I, I'll, I'll say something about Eric. Um, so Eric and I uh, started working for the city of San Dimas about the same time, 33 years ago. So 1990 was a pretty good year for, uh, for that. And uh, I've, over the years have interacted with Eric both as a homeowner um, and as a council person and on behalf of other people, uh, sometimes just to ask what was allowed, what's the right thing, and all that kind of stuff. And, and Eric was always good at explaining it very clearly and uh, in, in clear terms what it, what it was that the rules were. And that was one of the things about Eric that I seem to notice in my interaction with him anyway is that knew the code very well and gave you a straight answer. The answer might have had some nuances, as some of his emails would say, well, if you did this, but if you did this, and then, but, it was, but, uh, but I really appreciated that. The other thing is that Eric has a great sense of humor, has a great smile, gr really friendly person. Uh, that, I think, is a real plus when you're working and, and leading uh, people. And, um, and the last thing I'll say is, Eric is a real family man. His, uh, his wife and his two kids, uh, known them, <laughs> seen them grow up. And um, as I mentioned the other day at the lunch, um, you know, I remember some of the city events where each department had a uh, display or something like that. I, I always loved seeing what Eric would come up with because he would, there's at least a couple times where he would, he made a game that, you know, li literally made a game and um, had his, I think it was his son there with him, and uh, I can relate to that because I liked doing that too in the in the old days. But uh, anyway, you you will be missed. So thanks a lot for your years of service, Ryan. Eric, I'll say uh, one. I apologize. I didn't make it today to your luncheon. My professional duties uh, prevented me from making that. But uh, but I will say, you know. When I first got elected, and before, but when I first got elected and I had the opportunity to talk to you, um, it was interesting and kind of to what Council Member Ebner just said, you know, you have a way of, of articulating things that make them digestible. And I think that's difficult for some people uh, for as a resident um, to be able to come to the city and try to do something or understand something and then have that process in such a way that a lay person can understand it uh, and two is you've always been helpful and uh, you've always been uh, positive and very practical I think in, in solutions and I think you've also looked to protect the city um, not too long ago when we had the opportunity to chat um, I didn't know some of the things about the city that you shared with me in terms of some of the thought that went into some of these projects that were previously mentioned. And um, in hearing you talk about that and hearing you talk about the passion and, and the care that you have for San Dimas uh, will forever remain with me. And um, I know you, you lived uh, in the best district we would find out in San Dimas, as it turns out. And uh, it's been an honor to, to be able to sit here. And uh, I don't know whether you voted for me or not, but you got me. So, uh, you know, it is what it is. But, um, but I will say, though, that, you know, when you look at people, and especially being a, a staffer myself for a government agency, you look at people that are that are positive, that are motivated, that always keep the best interests of the organization in mind. I can truly say you've done that for this city and for the people that live here. I'm very grateful. Um, I also am a huge admirer of your talent and skill for all the various things you've created uh, in your office. And, uh, and, you know, whether it's woodwork or whether it's some of the other things you've done, um, you know, one day I hope to be able to have that talent because it's something when you go and you look at staff and you look at the different things that they do, 
you sometimes wonder what are those hobbies and how do those things align with what they do? And it really makes sense, like for you and your profession, like you really seem to have aligned very well with things that interest you uh, and then come to work and do it. My dad always said, if you love what you're doing, you'll never work a day in your life. And although I'm sure there were work days here, I really do think that you did have a great time here. And I can tell you, I've always enjoyed it. Congratulations. I wish you the best. Please stay in touch. And I definitely hope to pick your brain. Uh, if you see San Dimas start getting crazy and overbuilding, I hope you will remind me. Uh, you know, I don't think you will have to, though, but feel free to let me know. But thank you. Congratulations. And I wish you the best. Um, 30 years is a long time, but uh, I think in the grand scheme of things, it's just a blink of an eye, and I really do hope you have a very long, happy, and healthy retirement in uh, Texas. I think you said it all when you said that San Dimas is always going to be home for you, and uh, that really makes me feel good that uh, this is a home for you. It's not just a job, uh, and I think it says a lot about you as well. Um, I hope that, that uh, you're always going to think of us and uh, come back and visit when uh, when you're in town and uh, you know catch up with your San Dimas friends but uh, um, I, I think Eric we, we might have lost out on the num most number of Eric's per capita Eric, <laughs> I don't know I don't, I don't know if you pushed us over the edge there we're gonna have to do the math on that but congratulations and thank you for so many years of uh, your hard work I, uh, I just want to say thank you. I know that the city is better off because of you uh, and having been a lifelong resident growing up here and then coming back, I know that I've benefited from the work that you've done and the dedication you've had to the city. So thank you very much. It's because of you that I felt like I wanted to pursue um, council because I want to continue the legacy that you had started in your career and ensuring that this place continues to be a great place to live, work, and celebrate life. So I wish you the best in your retirement. I hope you enjoy it. It's well deserved. And we look forward to seeing you when you return uh, here for vacations or perhaps even moving back at some date. So thank you very much, sir, and good luck to you. You guys should have seen the billboard he was wearing yesterday for a shirt. You know, I've known Eric for a long, long time, pretty much as long as John has, uh, different capacities and, and stuff. But let me tell you, John is the person that creates an atmosphere around him. His people who work for him and work with him and amongst him, uh, they, they love him. Um, we've had some community members who actually love him, and we've had some community members who actually have questioned him. But the, the actual part of this whole thing is that Eric's always been the guy that I've known who always tried to get to yes, providing that the, the code allowed him to do it. And he could always, always come back and, and argue each, each, each point. But it was always good to see and hear from people who talk who would tell you that he always gave him some options it was either black or white, or here was an option. There was always some kind of option on how to get to what you want if you do this. I met with him uh, a few months back, and I mean, I think there was a little tear in his eye because he couldn't figure out how to help this poor guy out who already had built this huge monstrosity of a, of a, of a uh, canopy and shelter, but he couldn't move the guy's property line, and he couldn't do a whole lot of things, but he was... He spent many days, him and Jay, you know, our, probably our interim uh, uh, building official, um, meant many days trying to figure out how to do it. And then some guy named Henry No stepped in and said no. <laughs> so the reality is uh, we are going to miss, we are going to miss him. We only had him here in San Dimas as a resident about eight years or so. But uh, we finally convinced him to come from uh, Pasadena area and out there, but the reality is he, was, he not only was a great employee, but he was a great community member. Uh, you could run into him in the, in the, in the uh, city, and uh, no matter where he was, somebody walked up and asked him a question, you give him an answer. And Eric, you are a great 
community member and thank you very much for everything you've done. Um, I do want to make note that yesterday there was a, uh, a luncheon provided for uh, Eric by uh, the uh, employees and it was well packed. The place was full. The food was good. Eric was in his best as a mood. He, 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 I thought the roast was coming to the everybody else and not to Eric, but yeah, he, he had a great time. Eric, come back and see us. Thank you. Thank you. And where are the billboards? All right. Uh, Madam Secretary, could you, uh, do we have some uh, name cards? Speaker cards, I mean. Uh, first speaker is Anna Santana, speaking on housing discrimination. Thank you for the opportunity of allowing me to speak today. Uh, thank you, Honorable Mayor and uh, members of Council. Uh, I have been living in San Dimas for the past eight years at Avalon Bay Apartments. I relocated from Florida, and uh, this is my home. I enjoy living in San Dimas because it's a quaint town very historical, and I feel very comfortable. But uh, after COVID, everything has changed. Everything appeared to be upside down. And um, the reason I really should have said, um, not discrimination, but harassment. I've been exposed to harassment, humiliation, anxiety. Um, my health has been, uh, affected because I never expected that a big humongous corporation as Avalon that the uh, corporate offices in Virginia uh, would treat me in this manner. Uh, I have been you know what it is that your rent goes up 16 and a half percent then it goes up to 43%. And meanwhile, all your friends, because you're there eight years, oh, we only got an eight or a 10. And then when it was COVID, I did my, do, my duty to pay my rent in full. I never milked the system. Religiously on the first, because I'm on a fixed income of teacher's disability pension, unfortunately from Florida and based on their economy and my social security. So religiously, I make my payments. And for this company all of a sudden to be harassing me, I mean, even to the fact that on June 1st, I pay my rent. And then I negotiated, negotiated, because you know what it is to get an increase of 1,063 increase in rent? Well, finally, I was able to negotiate and bring it down significantly. I signed a renewal lease on June 17. And then when I opened the door on June 20th, there's a big uh, paper. And when I look at it, I says, what's going on? It was uh, that three day notice uh, because I, they gave me three day notice Otherwise, I would be evicted because, according to them, I owe $2,231, which I had said to them, can you roll back because I put on notice because I couldn't afford the rent, but out there when you look for an apartment, you have to make three times the income for that apartment, so I retracted. And so I thought that my rent would go back and they didn't do that. On the contrary, they started charging me three thousand five hundred and fifty. All right, ma'am. Two-bedroom apartment. Thank, thank you. I'd, I'll ask Mr. McKinney to talk to you. Please, because and I if need you don't help. Mind. Thank you. I really do. Okay. I appreciate He'll, the time 
and thank you all. I guess it's going to be Henry Noe who's going to talk to him. Talk. He's our planning director. He will, he will talk with you. Thank you so uh, much. All right, ma'am. Thank you. And I'm sorry for your difficulty. Next speaker is Ruth Lubin. <clears throat> I had to readjust this mic. Hi. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor um, and City Councilmen. There is nothing more harrowing than watching the roof of your house burn, especially on the eve of your son's surprise graduation party. And that's exactly what happened. But I want to tell you, there is nothing more amazing than watching your city council come together and help you. So within a couple of days afterwards, I had the help of you, Mayor, and of you, Mr. Nakano, and of you, Mr. Ebner, and of all of you come to my aid, and he brought me food. You asked how I was doing. You made sure that the police came by my house. You ensured that fire stopped by my house, not once, but twice. You, Mr. Constantine, answered my phone calls on more than one occasion. You, Mr. McKinney, have ensured that I have been taken care of, and when I have had questions, you have answered them. You know, many people live in a city, and we walk up here, and we talk about all the complaints that we have, and that's valid because we do have them. But we often don't speak about the times that we need you. And I have needed you over and over again. And you have been there. You have been there for me and my family in a time when we sat there and we watched it all burn. Literally, we watched it burn. And I just want to thank you I want to thank you for that because in one of the most difficult times in my life you have been there for me and my family and and that's meant the world to me of any place that I could possibly live I am so grateful that I live here in the city of San Dimas and that this is the place that I get to hang my hat and this is the place that I get to call home and I just want to thank you so, thank you. Thank you. Nora Chen. I need to adjust <laughs> speaker. <Yeah. laughs> Good evening, Mayor and member of uh, City Council. And today I'm going to uh, give you some update about the library services. If you haven't signed up our summer discovery program, please, uh, is, you still have time. You can sign up online or in person at the library. Uh, every three books you read, you just need to log in and do three another activity, you have a chance to win a prize. And surprise or not, last year we do have a customer just won a Kindle Fire. You will never know how reading can bring you that uh, can surprise you. And on Wednesdays, uh, every Wednesday uh, during the summer, we still have a performance uh, program. And so tomorrow we have at three o'clock that we have the voice of America's Fun Songs. It's a music show and it's a very good for the whole family. And next Wednesday, also at three, that we do have a bubble mania, that a performer will come here that uh, teach our science all about bubble soap, uh, small bubble, big size. Uh, bubbles, uh, square bubbles, it's uh, all about science. And uh, uh, on July 26th, it's also Wednesday at three o'clock, we do have a great white shark expedition. So we do have a uh, scientist will bring the, their kind, uh, their adventures and have their uh, kind of model, will give us some uh, education or surprise. So those are all good shows. So if you uh, haven't uh, been to our library, please visit us. 
And by the way, uh, I know this is summer and we, our uh, state park spots are very popular. We still have a lot, uh, some, sometimes they're just available. So if you are planning to visit some state par parks or beach parks, that you can come to a library, check out the uh, state parks. Sometimes they are popular, they are out. You can put a hold on it. And when you plan on that trip, guess what? You have free parking, so it's a great. Uh, so, and we also have a laptop and the hotspot for people to check out. Right now, you can check out up to six weeks. And surprise or not, we do have some still available for customers to check out. So, just uh, this uh, library is not just about books. We do have a lot of programs and the services that uh, you can just visit our website. Thank you. Thank you, Nora. Those are all the speaker cards, Mayor. Anyone, any, anyone else in the audience wishing to speak towards the council? Seeing none, we'll move towards the uh, consent calendar. All items on the consent calendar are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion unless a member of the city council requests separate discussion. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Seeing none, motion carries 5-0. I will say this is the first time that I've ever seen in all the years I've been around here a consent calendar with two items on it. So. <laughs> okay, we'll move on to other business. Consideration, review, and adoption of amendments of the city's boards, commission, and its committee handbooks. Chris? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. At our last meeting, we uh, continued a discussion of the boards and commissions with the direction provided by council to make certain changes to the document and to also go back through the document and making the other corrections or changes uh, that were of a technical, grammatical, and things of that nature. What I did in the intervening time frame is I created a matrix um, more akin to what we did the first year I arrived when we did a full review of the entire document and I placed the changes that are in the document in that matrix to allow us an easier way to just flow through the changes and make sure we're okay with what's being there. And so what you'll see in front of you now is, well, the first column talks about what area of the book it's in, the what section or subsection. The second column is the exact language and the track changes that are there. Some of them will have yellow highlights. The yellow highlights are intended to show some of the differences from the last agenda package to now. Some of those are corrections that several council members had made, just to make that a little easier. The third column gives a little bit of a justification, and then the next two columns are any ad additional information that may be beneficial or whatnot although it really comes down to what the council desires. So my recommendation is to quickly move through the changes and then have the council stop me when they want to discuss an area in particular. Is that something that's amenable to the council? Yeah. Okay, perfect. So we'll start at page one, the introduction. Just added clarity, added the city council and uh, change the director of the department to department director, just a clarifying change under the purpose. Added some language instead of city operations, the discussions really of matters that impact the quality of life and operations of the city, so it broadened that discussion. We added then participation on the commission to include all the programmatic areas within the purview of the respective commission, committee, and board. The council's intent last year when they changed this was to ensure very broad discussions of the, count of the commissions, committees, or boards within the areas of their purview. Section one, history of San Dimas. We changed the population number to reflect the most current numbers by the Department of Finance. The next section, we changed the order of uh, industrial, commercial, residential to have a focus on residential as the primary and then the opportunities for commercial and industrial. There's just one typo there, opportunities was put twice, so I'm striking that second opportunity. Under section two, the city manager, um, the current municipal code designates the city manager as an ex officio non-voting member of every commission. So I added the first part that's highlighted in yellow to 
to cite that code section and then we added the word non-voting to make it very clear that the, the city manager does not vote. On the next page under director of community development, I added more description about the housing function. This is a relatively new function and how we've expanded it. So we put a little more description there. Item H, De uh, Department of Parks and Recreation. Before it listed four divisions, when in reality there's only three divisions, but one of those divisions, landscape maintenance, we called out specifically the community forest based on how much discussion the council has had in the last couple of years about the community forest. Public safety is a new section we added recently, fully describing the police, fire, and our emergency response um, aspects as well as our regional response with Area D. Section three, committees, commi uh, committees and board, commissions, committees and boards. Um, the council in its discussion back in February um, removed the uh, student member or youth member of the Parks and Recreation Commission and put this generic language to have the ability to put a student or youth on any commission um, and allow that to occur and to be selected and appointed by staff and the schools for between somebody with the age of 16 to 21. So that's why this language is added there. The next page, the development plan review board. We remove the word rural at the request of a council member. Uh, a question commission. We corrected three full consecutive terms to two and we changed the liaison from the assistant city manager to the director of parks and recreation who has traditionally been the liaison. Under parks and recreation commission, we corrected the three to two terms. Uh, the council has also changed the size of the commissions to five commissioners um, that all of whom will have two year terms. We've also removed the language that referenced the youth commissioner since we now have generic language that a youth student would be on every commission. Under D, the planning commission, we referenced that the meetings would occur on Tuesdays. Uh, they, they're occurring on Thursdays, so we need to correct that to be Thursdays until such time as the planning commission recommends that they change their schedule. Under public safety, we have five members plus two appointed by the civilian advisory board. Originally, the language created term limits of two two-year terms for everybody, including the civilian advisory board. This language changed that to allow the community advisory boards to not have an end, uh, an end number of terms at the request of council. The next two, the senior and the golf course advisory commission, we corrected from three to two terms. And in senior commission, we changed the number of members from f nine to five. On the next page, under the nominations and appointments, we clarify the language here. The intent was when somebody applies to be on a commission that their application shall be active in the year at which they submitted it, except if they submitted it in November or December, in which case it will also be active the entire following year. Under primary commissions, these are our top commissions, equestrian, parks and rec, planning, public safety, and the senior commission. We outlined the new, <coughs> excuse me, the new process for selecting those commissions. At five members, each member would be appointed by the respective council member or mayor so that each of you have a selection. It discusses the process and it also discusses the process if the uh, majority of council wishes to reject somebody's appointment and how do we get that position filled after that. The next page, other boards, commissions, and committees. So this is anything other than the five main commissions. What is that appointment process and selection? These commissions do not have five members. They're very members. And in one case have members from other, another jurisdiction, the city of Laverne, who we jointly have a partnership with for the golf course. The next section below that, that all appointees to commission, committee, or board must be registered to vote in the city of San Dimas or by virtue of their appointment if they can be from another city. For example, the chamber appointing a business owner who may not live in the city but have a business here. They must be a registered voter in their respective city to participate. The next section down, any member of the commission um, cannot serve concurrently on one of the 
five main commissions, but we clarified language that they may be able to serve on another committee or board. The intent was that we offer the most number of residents participation in the five main commissions, but not for, uh, forestall the opportunity for them to serve on a subsidiary type of committee or board. Term of office, we had changed the terms from three two-year terms to two two-year terms, and we clarified that here. We also clarified um, about partial terms and who, which entity can you can receive a partial term. It will apply to all bodies appointed by the council. We also added language on the development review board, which appointed to two-year terms. However, there were no term limits established for a DPRB member. On the next page, appointment of employees relative. Uh, note, we noticed that there was an oversight. We referenced commission only. We didn't reference committee or board. So I added that language back in because I believe the intent of the council was that all appointed bodies of the council that these rules should apply and remove the word commissioner and put applicant instead to apply to all three bodies. We had previously also added stepchilds of spouse for the commissioner or step parent. It was an oversight that allowed for certain people to be uh, allowed where in other instances they wouldn't be. So that was change was made um, several months ago. Uh, under Section F, seeking personal interest or benefit, we expanded commission to include the committees or the, and the boards and did the same thing as we did in the previous section regarding appointment of a relative. Under G, resignation and removal, the council added explicit language that you're able to remove a member of a commission, committee, or board by a vote of three council members. Uh, there, was a there was a highlight at the last meeting that if the council rejected an appointment of a commissioner, um, and th the first time that in order to reject the commissioner, the second or third or future times would require a four-fifths vote. Um, that wouldn't change the council's ability to later remove somebody by a vote of three. It was just a note of caution to recognize that there may be a way to circumvent that process, but that there wasn't an expectation that that would occur. If it does, the council can address this by changing this in the future. On the next page, under H, attendance. We added more explicit language about attendance. So if there is a commissioner, committee, or board member who misses two meetings in a rolling year, there's a notification process that will notify them that if they shall miss three in that rolling period, there's an automatic removal from the commissions. And the language for that automatic removal are included here. Under benefits, uh, there was language that looked highly unusual uh, that I recommend removing. It says that members are covered by workers' compensation while providing service as a commissioner or committee appointees. We don't regularly provide workers' compensation to a non-employee, so I don't know how that language ended up being in the document. If under state law, workers' comp shall apply, it shall apply regardless of whether it's stated here or not. I wanted to avoid adding an additional benefit that wasn't necessarily something mandated by law. Under incidental expenses, Talk, just added some clarity about reimbursements for travel, for training uh, to include, and has been pre-approved through the budget process. We should be telegraphing what training commissioners are going to and then budgeting in the budget process to ensure that the funds are there, that all the planned trainings can be funded. Under K, ethics, we had added the two required trainings that are required under state law that has been in there since the March version that you've seen previously. Under Section L, Rosenberg's rules, we added very specifically that the commissions, committee, and boards shall be governed by the same rules that the, bo the governing body, the council is. Those are Rosenberg's rules and not the more complex Roberts rules of order. Under the next section, we had a correction under quorum. That quorum is a, consists of a majority of the seats on the commission, and in this case should reflect commission, committee, and, bo and boards. That's what's required under the Brown Act. Under minutes, we added just clarifying that except for clerical errors, that minutes must be approved by the board. Sometimes it does occur that we find a typo in a minute that is not material. We don't necessarily bring the minutes back to correct a grammatical or a typo. We make the change in the minutes if it doesn't have a material impact. So I just wanted to clarify that. We also removed tapes of meetings and made it recording so we no longer tape a meeting. Under the Political Reform Act, Section M, I removed the council members instead of council members and planning commissions because our intent is to bring forth a separate document that applies to the council so we don't need that reference in the boards and commissions handbook although political reform act still applies to you even though we remove this language 
under section six relationships interactions with staff we expanded commissioners to include committee members and board members to reflect any of the bodies that you may appoint S uh, subsection b interaction with the city council the city council decided to remove council liaisons from the commissions so we struck this language from the handbook the next section uh, each commission will be responsible to present an update to the city council on a regular scheduled city council meeting on an annual basis there was a request at some point that the council from the council that we have our commissioners come forth annually and do an update to council i think you saw all the commissions come forth over several meetings earlier this year for their annual reports we intend to do that every year under section seven commission effectiveness subsection b effective conflict management um, all persons speaking should clearly identify themselves. We can't require them. It, it, before we said they must identify themselves. The Brown Act does not allow you to, dic to require somebody to identify themselves if they're publicly speaking. It's their desire. And then on the next page, which is under Section 8, Approvals and Modifications, uh, the uh, we remove the requirement to come annually to council with the handbook. We figured if there's a change that needs to be made, we will bring that forth. If the council desires a change, they can re recommend that. So with that, Mr. Mayor, these are all the changes or the material changes in the handbook. The handbook as presented in the agenda plus what you see, the minor changes we made here are all the changes we're recommending for approval. So with that, I will turn it back to you for discussion. Okay. Okay, questions? I have very few questions. You have what? Very few questions. What? I know, it's hard to believe. Um, but uh, thanks, Chris. I think the, uh, boy, I was going through this and I was noticing you caught just about everything and things that I hadn't seen. So uh, the typos and everything else just uh, have vanished. That's really great. Um, I did have a couple questions, um, just for clarifications. Um, the, the one thing that may be important to change is in section four and it's 4e so up in 4d for employees relatives you you caught uh, the uh, child child's spouse and uh, you, you changed it to child or stepchild and then you we added parent or step parent um, very good um, next section where it's relatives of city man council or city manager it still says child spouse and i suggest that it should say child's or stepchild's spouse page you on, John? okay it's page 72 of the agenda packet page 18 of the handbook itself and section four which is commission committees and boards is the title of it and it's there's that so it's below the chart that shows all the relatives mm -hmm. the next section down below the third fourth line down um it says child spouse and just to make that consistent with the chart above it's which says child's or stepchild's spouse i'm suggesting that for council members that same language should be uh, be in there i think what you're asking is a line the table for the city uh, with the city manager and the council and the commissioners all being the same you know i didn't go line by line to see if they're all the same but for that particular line uh, yes that's and that's just uh, a suggestion um but my question um i had one question and it has to do with uh you know we've been at this process for quite a while and i think we expected to have it done a year ago when people were you know uh going to be elected in um 20, 2022 and then they would be able to appoint and all or whatever you know if, assuming we're going that direction now we're having the situation where in the handbook it says these new terms are going to start on september 1st 2023 now remember they're two-year terms so I'm wondering what happens to a person uh, if there's a new council member, a new member of the council, 
because there's the mayor and two council seats that are up for election next year. Um, and, and then the person who's elected in March of 2024, they will have to wait a year and six months before appointing somebody. And, and I thought that the idea originally was that when council members got on, give them a couple months to get up to speed, but they should be appointing, be able to appoint somebody fairly soon. So I think there's a number of areas that there's some nuances that if we wanted to continue trying to drill down, we can. Um, originally, the first meeting we had on this was a Saturday meeting in February, the first Saturday in February, where we were able to get the council together to discuss this. And it was important to the council that we discuss it together. And, that we, and it was directed that that meeting should be on a weekend so that this is really the only thing that we would talk, it's not during the work day. And so that's why you saw a delay from the point at which the council had the elections and seats and when we first had the conversation. And so um, the way that the, the handbook is written, council would be making their appointments today and they would take effect September 1st. Those appointments would be good for two years. And presume if you, I presume that you reappoint your same appointments going forward, those people can go another two years. In the intervening time, if a council member switches, there is nothing in the handbook that precludes a new council member from proposing a new appointee for a position that a current member is in either their first or their second term in the middle of it or at the end. Because it, what it would be, I would imagine, would be I'm appointed a new council member, and it's like, while I, you know, I really like the work of John Smith, um, I really want to appoint Mary Smith. So I like the council to appoint Mary Smith and replace John Smith. It would require three votes of the council, and that person is hereby replaced, and the terms then would start over for that new member. Uh, it may or may not be the eventuality that occurs. It may be that John Smith is. You know, I meet John Smith and he's perfectly fine and I keep him there. But the language that we put in there about removal for three all, and the appointment with three votes still applies. So at any point in time, you can replace your appointee. That's, uh, that, that's, uh, <laughs> that, that's kind of okay with me to leave it the way it is right now in order to get something on, on the books. Um, however, that does seem unfair to a a person who was appointed this, you know, September basically, and six months later there's an election. And, oh no, the person who appointed me is is out. Now, in it's not till August where when a replacement is required. Um, but on the other hand, that person is being not only having one year of of the person's term in office. They and we say they get two two years, and and I guess what I'm wondering is is that is that really fair w without some reason that the person did something wrong or or, or something like that because I, I i'd hate to get to the point where we're just willy-nilly replacing com commissioners um just whenever we feel like it i mean we can, so we can do it right we can we don't have to have a reason but it just just doesn't seem like uh that would be the right thing to do Shall be allowed to finish that first term, 
that there is isn't not necessarily to be awarded in the second term. That's something we can always discuss and determine how to Yeah, I, and I'm good with that. I'm, I just wanted to bring it up. It is a question, and um, but I, I personally am willing to not make a big deal about it right now, but, you know, in the next few months, it would be good to clarify that, and there might be a couple other things that need to be clarified. I, I do think the, um, I appreciate you bringing that up, because I, I think the, um, when we started this discussion, I vividly remember Councilmember Nakano kind of talking about the, the time frame to a point following the election, and I know we actually had a pretty robust discussion about it. I almost wonder if it makes sense for the alignment of appointments to align with the <clears throat> And again, so we're not, nobody freaks out about what I'm about to say, but not by district in terms of appointments. But what I'm saying is align the terms with the seats. So if, if I'm up, you know, and, and well, who's up next? Uh, Eric, you're up, Weber, you're up next, and uh, John. So what if we aligned the appointment terms with the three months? Because I think we talked about if it was like a, a primary in June, this would all take effect in September, and then we prorate the appointments now. Does that make sense? So in other words, I wouldn't have, you prorate my appointments for whatever the time is, you pro prorate whatever we appoint right now is just to get us into cycle, and then basically immediately follow, following the, the next election, then you start the effective term. Does that make sense? So if I get this correctly, so if Councilmember Ebner makes an appointment, let's say in August for starting September 1st, that appoint person appointed to, let's say, the Parks Commission would serve until the election, and then Councilmember Ebner it r runs and is reelected, that person could remain with for two full terms. Right, so there's this onboarding period, right, is what we're talking about, just getting this thing going. And actually, in a discussion earlier, I think, with the mayor, today uh, we were having is, you know, how do you offset the appointments so we don't have a complete collapse of the commissions at any given point, right? We need to, the issue isn't necessarily getting to the construct, it's how we get there right now. So if the idea is you align the appointments, so technically your guys' appointments would be September of 24, and that's when their appointment starts, but in the interim we prorate, if you will, or you appoint now, just to get whoever you want to get to there or extend terms perhaps. And then that's you know up to you guys and your selection, but that gets them up and running. And then same thing for the, the rest of us here. Well, and the mayor too, actually, because the mayor is gonna be every two years. And then for Nakano and I, basically ours would be September of 26, I think, if that's right. And then we would basically, well, that's two, at least two years, so oh. I mean, we, Theoretically, that's when our ter the terms would be up. So, well, we could to, just to make it easy. Um, I like I like where you're going. It does actually make it administratively easier, and it does then stagger the appointments. What we could say is these initial appointments that will be done for September first shall effectively be term zero. Term zero goes for between September first and the point at which that council member who made such appointment um, is up on the election. So what happened in Councilmember Ebner's case, it would be between now and the election next year. In Councilmember Vienna, it would be between now and two, two and a half years out. That first period would not count as a term. It would be the initial period zero. And once we get to that election year, regardless of what the council members there, you're gonna be now on the staggered cycle and the commissioners, you'll be staggering the experience on the commission. So that actually could work out nicely. What's the council's pleasure? It's fine with me. That makes sense. Makes sense to me. I think I'm at a place where I need to process it a little bit more, and, and here's why. I, I see the merits of it. The only concern and caution I have is that I worry that these appointments will be so tied to individual council members that we will lose the ability of these commissioners from feeling like they are able to act and speak independently and offer advice. I see what's going on in another city um, close to LA where it is very clear those divisions are personal and you're either in someone's camp or you're not. And so 
That is my concern, is that if these members are so tied to a council member and are acting as the voice of that council member, rather than acting as advisors with a measure of independence to be able to work and speak freely and provide the best advice they can to council and to city staff, do I think the possibility is likely? No. But it is a possibility nonetheless, and so that is one thing that I, I'm just a little cautious of. I don't know if I can make that snap decision today, because I do worry they would just be friends of council members to do bidding of that member and no, nothing else. I understand. I can, can, so I can understand that point, since each of you will be making your own selection. Our current process has been the mayor and the staff liaison and the council liaison serving on a commission making appointments. And so the structure you've had so far is that one individual who has been appointed to the commission, let's say Council Member Weber to the Equestrian Commission, has a significant influence on any vacancy that now occurs on that commission and can drive the decisions of the folks that are there then appointed to that commission. So I think if I if the goal is to try to get to a very objective collective council type of decision then the process then neither of the processes we've had the one we have now that we're proposing and the one we had before necessarily get us to that yeah i understand i just don't want people to say oh i'm eric nakano's guy i'm gonna do I mean, what does he think about this i really don't want them to actually consider what i think i want them to offer the best advice whether it matches what i think or not because that, in my mind, is the intent of these commissions. It's to offer independent advice objectively. I, uh, I think you have a point, and there's definitely a possibility that that could occur, but a lot of the, uh, the stuff that you're talking about, like, you know, mm -hmm. I hope that they wouldn't think that is all stuff that we would have to, you know, do our due diligence on the front end and front load them as a, as a uh, candidate or a commissioner. Um, you know, the... Uh, the other part of it is that, uh, as Chris was saying, that um, that the way that the, the commissions currently are, are set out, I think the idea was to kind of divest ourselves from any one particular council member having too much of an influence over any particular uh, commission. Um, and then this way, you know, theoretically speaking, um, I, I guess each council member was elected by the uh, constituency in their district and theoretically speaking, whatever it was that that person said or did or their personality um, or their ethics or values reflect that of that particular subset of the community. So that should carry through onto the, um, to the uh, commissioner to, to an extent, not necessarily decision making or, or their personal views, but um, it, I, I would hope that if any particular district, uh, if any one of us got reckless, with the influence that we were exerting over any particular commissioner, I would hope that that would be noticed by the constituency and take a note come election time. So that's kind of my, I, I see where you're getting at. I think yeah, it's I, a I valid I just feel concern. like I need more time to think because I just feel like if we tie it to the districts, there is a much larger incentive for them to align themselves or think, you know what I mean, if, if they want to be reappointed and all that. And I just, I just have concerns whereas for now, it feels almost like a formality. Council member nominates me, I serve. You start tying it to districts and the fate of whatever council member is up for election. I just, I have some trouble processing what that would translate into long term. So I'm not against it. I just, I think I just need to think about it a little bit more about what that could mean and whether that is something that would open up unintended consequences that is not the intent of the five of us here. I can't imagine any of us want that to happen. There's always a possibility in the future that that could happen. So that's- If, if the hang up, I guess I'm trying to under, I'm trying to follow the, the, the issue. So if we pushed it out to a year later, which is basically where we are now, are you saying you would not have a problem with it? I just haven't thought, I haven't given it enough thought. And so trying to come up right now on the spot is this something that is the wisest thing to do. I can't 
make that determination. Got it. Well, I think that's that, kind of where I'm at right now. So the point Eric brings up, it really goes to the heart of the appointment process. And one of the main drivers of this whole revision was the appointment process. So, you know, we had, as you mentioned, the mayor and the council liaison were interviewing everybody and, cho and choosing, choosing or nominating the, uh, the members. At one time, it wasn't even that way. It was just, who wants to do the equestrian commission? Two people would just do it. So, so just to throw another, another choice in there, not, not to try to prolong the discussion or, or, or muddy the waters, um, it, it would be to avoid what Eric is talking about, where council member, where commissioners are beholden or feel beholden or somehow think they owe something to the appointing council member, you could have a rotating subcommittee of two people for all the vacancies. So let's just take an example. Say, say we have five members on the Equestrian Commission. The five members would be appointed. You know, Eric and Eric would point uh, would interview um, Eric and Emmett would interview one. Emmett and I would interview one. Something like that to where everybody's getting there's a subcommittee and uh, th there's there's downsides to that as well. So the bottom line for me anyway is that. Um, I think the appointment process that we're anticipating with everybody having their individual no nominations, I think it definitely has problems. Uh, I think it makes the appointments more political and everything that I, I think, Eric, is one of the things you're talking about or thinking about. On the other hand, um, there's a lot of changes here and I'm willing to go ahead and accept this particular change. The, the appointment yeah. by I think, council member. I think and we'll get later on to what happens if we want to have seven members on a commission. But, but for this, the five anyway, the five first appointments, whatever you want to call, call it, that's, um, I'm good there. And I'm also good at, you know, I know we've been dragging this out, yeah. but I'm good at waiting. So. No, I, th I think you make a good point. I think it's worth, there is a risk there um, for now. The purpose for the purpose of expediency and to operationalize something however those risks may play out we should try to move forward with some sort of a solution rather than engineer a solution to a problem that hasn't yet arisen i do think the um it's a fascinating issue and i completely agree to disagree with john on this particular matter on how we got here because i don't think there's enough diversity and thought and equity on the commissions and that's why some of these changes when we talked about them in the beginning got there uh, i don't think that whether it's public safety or whether it's parks and recreation or some of the others that there are enough divergence in thought to get the best outcomes and that goes to the appointments and that's really kind of the crux of how we get there and make sure that you know to a certain degree, yes, but I, I don't want to be so naive as not to say each one of us has played a part in appointing people, you know, and you will as well. And I think making sure that you and you and you and you and you and I all have the opportunity to say, you know, there's somebody I think would add something great to that commission or a different thought or something else, you know, and that I don't care which commission it is. I just know right now there are certain commissions whether it's my own personal feeling or it's been mentioned to me that people go, you know, hey, well, that's either Ryan's commission or that's John's commission pretty blatantly. I mean, out in the community. And that's not, and I think part of the reason we even talked about removing the liaisons was for the independence of those commissions. And really to say, to your point, you know, we want to be able to appoint, I think, people that want to serve and provide good thought and all of that stuff, but at the same token, not have them be any one of us individually, right? It should be the city's commission, you know? So I, I, I hope we get there. If there's unintended consequences, <laughs> just like anything else, we can adjust, right? And I think, uh, and I think we will. Um, but I just hope, I hope there is a lot of changes here and some of them were not even things that I thought we would get to, frankly. I didn't even, some of these I didn't even know were gonna come forward. But I think in the end, this, the training we added, we know that was not something that was previously in here. Um, we, we found a process, and uh, if we need to change it, we'll change it. Yeah. I think you raise good points, um, and 
I think it is time to move forward with them with that proposal if it has the support of the other members. All right, so I'll, I mean, I guess I will, is there more? Uh, uh, we're not ready for motion. Uh, 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 all right, no. you're right, I have to wait for you so I can substitute. You have something more to say? <laughs> I, well, I, yeah, you wanna start getting- okay, well, we may as well get this out of here. We'll be here okay. three months from now. So one thing I just wanna bring up, and I don't know even how to even address this, is the continuity on it on the commissions so it's not really something that's addressed in the handbook and I'm not sure if anybody's thought about it but there's a potential of like five of, of the commissions being completely new starting September 1st I mean we could literally have five new planning commissioners and I think that's probably the the biggest one to think about um, and even if we only had three new planning commissioners you know that is a and then all of a sudden they've got a meeting that, that uh, whatever Thursday it is and they've got to be making decisions on something that's probably in the pipeline the downtown specific plan for example is is rolling along and is coming forward so that kind and it's it's the same way on all the commissions um, if you aren't appointing members who are and who says you are going to and nobody's beholden and nobody has to appoint current members but it just seems that the, um, the uh, learning curve and the ability to really function, um, the commissions could be dysfunctional for at least two, three, four months, in my opinion. So I'm just bringing that up as a concern about the wholesale switcheroo on, on September 1st. I appreciate the point. I think if I would bet money, there's not gonna be five you know, not a majority of new members, I would think. I think, you know, none of us are beholden to uh, reappointments or anything like that. But uh, I think we as a council would be foolish not to see the wisdom in some of the uh, tenure experience and the continuity that we've had with some of the uh, commissioners. So I, and that's all I'm going to say about it. But I just, I can't imagine that uh, this council doesn't have that insight. And I appreciate you bringing it up. I, I guess I'm a little bit in the fog. I, when do you expect to, to say these commissions, you said today, but in fact nobody has appointed or talked to anybody or anything else. When do you actually believe these commissions will be in place functional, no matter what their makeup is? If the council approves this today with what I see as the four changes, we would be moving forward this week to start advertising for those commissions. We made a decision that if a council member was going to reappoint an existing commissioner, no application, no additional steps are necessary other than the council member making sure that that individual is willing to serve. And so a, a council member could say, I want to appoint so-and-so who's the chair of the senior commission to be on the senior commission. And then all those appointments would come together at the second meeting in August for formal appointment. And once we do that, then you know the full makeup of the commissioners September 1st. And they would start their two-year terms from what date? Well, th the fourth change that was listed, which I think addresses the future uh, staggeredness, Council Member Vienna's re uh, recommendation that we look at the period between now and the next election cycle for each respective council member could be that period zero. Um, addresses the staggeredness going forward so you're not going to have all the commissions turning over at the same time. The intervening time, the appointments are where, as Council Member Ebner raised, if the council then appointed completely new commissions in every respect, then yes, we would have fully new commissions and that history wouldn't necessarily carry itself over. Did I get that? Yeah, I think I, think I got what you said. Well, I'm just going to make one statement and and, and I... Ryan kind of hit on it, and there's the difference in commissions and that that thought process that you know certain commissions are beholden to you know whoever or whatever, and, and you know that may or may not be true. Long story short, but I believe that we have spent one solid year dealing with a problem that wasn't a problem, in my opinion. Okay, I'm willing to go along with it. Okay, because that's what the rest of the council. But the commissions have always worked pretty smoothly. 
yeah, it's always been a complaint here or that about the makeup and somebody's you know beholden to who, but the reality is the way we the way we did it. Now, don't get me wrong. I was a very much of an advocate of doing away with the liaison because I believe that the staff should be working with the commission chairs and setting the dates and setting whatever they need to do. But the reality is we have, we, we have total turmoil, in my opinion, okay, over something that wasn't that broken that we should not have been able to repair fairly simple if there was a real room. So, it's, I mean, it's a great document. I saw it one hour ago. One hour ago I saw this. And, then, and I don't know about anybody else in that audience or out there in TV land, but I don't think there's very few of us that could probably digest the changes that were made here. So, I no longer have a soapbox. I'm done. <laughs> uh, can I ask a question? Um, <clears throat> what would we do with the applications that we've been gathering throughout this process? and? and uh, community members who were interested. I would prefer just those remain on file and we are able to review those when we make our appointments. Right, I would, I, would I agree so. with that. And I think we talked about language last time, I think it was August or something, right? That they would carry over to the following year, right? Well, some of these have, have been, they, we they do, could do, be over, do have year, people. over a year old. The way I understand it, we do have people that are interested in, in certain commissions and, and we're waiting to see when we're going to open this up, you know, either the Planning Commission or, or Law Enforcement Commission or anything, Public Safety. You know, there are people out there waiting to be able to apply for now right. when we're moving forward. Right. And as soon as we approve something, then new applications can be solicited. I'm sure it'll be on our website, people who are tuning in who, who would know about it. But as the ones we have on file would still be considered. Well, I don't know. I think the ones we have on file should go, I mean, just to be consistent. Because I, I can understand that they've been waiting a long time. But to be consistent and follow the rules, the rule is, as Chris so well stated it, if they were received this year, yeah, they're still valid. If they're re received at November or December of last year, they're still valid. Anything older than that is not valid. But as a courtesy, what I would do is call each one of those or somehow contact, email them, however they want to be contacted, and say, hey, we just got the commission procedure process figured out, so do you still want to apply? Have them reapply. Okay. Yeah, I guess the thing is, too, and I heard what you said earlier about if we were going to do a reappointment that a sitting commissioner would not have to reapply, um, but... <laughs> I kind of have heartburn with that. Um, not that I won't consider reappointing because I may and I very well think I will. But I think that in terms of equity, like I almost wonder like if everybody for this, you know, term zero or whatever you want to call it should apply or at least submit that they're interested um, so that we know even if those people that are currently sitting on them want to continue their service then at least that tells us each as we're trying to figure out. Because make no mistake, and as the mayor and I were talking earlier today, each one of us is going to have to look at each commission and think about what we're going to do. I mean, that's like no small task, especially when you start looking at not just who's currently serving, um, but who may want to serve, right? And so, um, so I wonder about that because we need to assess interest of people to continue. I, I think you raise a good point, and I think it also offers the opportunity to make this a little more streamlined. What we could do is advertise this both internally, our current commissioners, and externally as immediately, are you interested in serving on any of our commissions, committees, or boards? Here's a listing of them. Submit your interest. Chris Constantine out and the commissions you want to serve on, public safety equestrian. Yeah, that's huge because, the, the and this is <laughs> something else Mayor and I were talking about earlier today is, you know, we all collectively have to figure out there's only so many seats and we have to figure out who goes where and that may not mean that someone who's currently on a current x commission may not want to go to y or try their service somewhere else they might be open to that so what we could do is we do that solicitation make it really easy for somebody to say i want to be on one of these two or three commissions 
to get them on a board that we could have that said, here are the individuals that have submit, submitted their interest, here are the commissions they want to serve on. And as council members select individuals, we ensure that they complete the application package so we have a complete package of those individuals and try to start getting the ones that haven't been selected so that we have applications for all of them. Because in some cases, you'll have folks soliciting interest that you know nothing about. And so the application is intended to solicit some of that details to be able to know. And, and are you saying And, and what would that outre outreach be? So that's two oh. different, you're talking two different steps. Our first step. An interest card and then an application. Correct. So current commissioner X, uh, the part I don't understand, is that person going to have to submit a new application? They would have to do both parts. Submit an interest they want to be on the commission and then complete another application that they did maybe years ago. A planning commissioner could have been many years ago. Right. Okay. I mean, it, to help them, we could send them their old application. I mean, we could. If, if somebody's interested, just so, because I know that, but, but either way is fine. I think that's fair because then everybody, all the council members have all the applications of right. everybody yeah. involved. Yep. And I wonder if the, um, this interest form, do we need to create it? Mm -hmm. Is it something that we could put all of the board's commissions and committees on there and put the dates and times that they meet um, at whatever interval? Because I think that's something, you know, if you're looking at that as interest, it may or may not work for your commitments outside so we can make sure that they've got all the information up front. And, and who sets the dates and times for the, for the uh, commission meetings? So does the, that, is that the staff or is that the chair? That is you. It's in the handbook, so you select them. Yeah, until something changes. Correct. That doesn't preclude a special meeting or a delay in a meeting that the chair and the staff liaison could decide on, but the standard meetings are set by the handbook. All right. All right. There's the other thing that I, just one other thing I want to talk about. Anything you want to talk about, John? And in the vein of having an interest card, is there anybody else on the council who's interested in having seven members on the Parks and Rec and Senior Citizens Commission? If, if, I, if there is, I don't have to make a big speech. So I'm in generally in favor of more opportunities for people to volunteer in this instance. Uh, I think I've stated that my main focus is to try to move this to a close, but if you are looking to discuss why you believe seven is preferable over five, uh, I'm certainly willing to entertain that time for you to make a statement on that. Okay. This is the simplest of changes, if you like the idea. Um, as, as Eric mentioned, having more people on the commissions is, is better because it provides more opportunities for involvement and gives more perspective. And um, the handbook states encourage broad community uh, in, uh, involvement or participation. And the more the better, I, I think, until it gets unwieldy. And I think that seven is a very manageable number of people. The Public Safety Commission that we are proposing to adopt will have seven community members. There are five appointed by the council and two get there some other way. Let's just say that it's by the sheriff, but let, there's two others another way. What I'm proposing is that there be, the question commission is good at five. That's the only one I wouldn't increase unless there was like a whole bunch of interest in the equestrian commission. Yeah, only, because, only because the equestrian is hard to fill the five seats to begin with. The other two, the senior commission and the uh, parks and rec, there are more than an, more people who want, more people than seats who want to be on the commission. So, so I, I won't go into all the benefits of having more people, like more involvement, more community knowledge, the city council getting more benefit, all that kind of stuff. But let me just tell you the appointment process. So we need another way, in my opinion, to get the two extra members. And the way I would do it, and this isn't just me, I've talked to some people about this, including chairs of commissions who are interested in having the extra members. And you would have, you point the five to begin with, and it, once it gets rolling, you've got the, the whole commission there. But the chair of the commission 
and the director of the department involved with that commission. So in this case, the director of parks and recreation for both commissions and the chair of the senior commission or the chair of the parks and recreation commission would make a nomination, or two nominations in the city council. And they're from the applications like everything else, but that's the simple change that the two additional members, just like we spell out how it's done for the public safety, it has about two lines about that, two or three lines about the sheriff appointing him. You would have two or three lines on these other commissions saying the director and the chair would nominate. That is my proposal. That is one I'm will willing to uh, hold that that's, that's got to be in there. Seven members. Okay. What was that last name? And that's where you. I, I will not vote for the handbook, to be clear, unless there are seven members on the senior and the, pl and the Parks and Rec Commission. Okay. All right. I think I've laid out a pretty simple, straightforward way of doing it. And the chairs of both those commissions, we asked their opinion. They came here, they stood there, and they said we should have seven members. Well, yeah, but I think they also said that they could deal with five if, they, if, if that's what it was. Each one of them has told me personally that they want seven members. Let me make it clear. They want seven members. Senior is already being reduced from nine, so seven. They only have seven anyway. And they have seven people on there right now, correct. And they're functioning pretty well. What is the, the function of the two civilian advisory board members? You mean how do they interact on the commission? No, like uh, there's clearly a, a function that the sheriff's department sees value in their appointment. But would it be would it be in, inappropriate for the captain to, to meet, speak to the CAC people? Or the question is: Is it inappropriate for the would captain? Would it be inappropriate for the captain to speak to the CAC representatives? I mean, speak to us about what their function no. is. No, not at all. The only reason that I bring that up is my impression was that they have a different function than just extra members of the uh, commission. And it was of special interest because it was... Yeah. Gosh, would you be able to speak to that? They're not appointed by the city. So therefore, they're not city appointments. They're not appointed by the council. That's correct. So... Um, yes. Maybe while the... Uh, if the captain's going to come up, maybe while he's coming up, I just have to add a comment on to John's uh, proposal because there is a state statute that requires the city council to appoint essentially the city council to appoint all the city commissioners so we could not have a process where the commission itself appoints one of its commissioners but the chair of the commission and the ch or the chair and some other commissioner could make a recommendation to the council to appoint you know if I said appoint I nominate is the right word Oh, that's what you meant, is that they would make a recommendation yeah, I, oh, to I'm the sorry. council. Yeah, oh, I'm sorry. That's absolutely, okay. that's absolutely crucial. Right. It comes to the council. Got it. And okay. it's out of the applications we get. So it's just a way of doing, I mean, there are other ways you could do it. I mean, you could have a rotating committee. No, no, no. If, people, if it's just a recommendation to the council, then that completely right, works. Right, right. So it's just a nominating process. All right. Well, while, while the captain's coming up, I, I will say uh, I, I have also expressed that I have... Yeah, an interest in seven, but I also understood that there were multiple suggestions of being done, and I uh, ways of appointing and doing whatever. I had not. I, I said decided I'd move along with five, and then I'd wait to hear about the seven. And we, the staff would ask the staff to bring back some type of of uh, report on how this would actually function and whatever. But on the other hand, I'm starting to feel like, you know, like. We're being hostages, and I'm not going to get. A, I'm not going to go into that. Hi there. So the question was what again? I, I was just kind of looking for the general function of the um, uh, the appointees from the sheriff's department to the public safety commission. Just what their function is. How they uh, are they liaisons between uh, the sheriff's department and the uh, commission, or what kind of what is their function? Right, so um, most of our community advisory council members are, <clears throat> they're out there to enlist the community support for local law enforcement activities, educate the community on the needs and goals of law enforcement, 
and assist local station staff in creating new programs and um, they're uniquely suited to uh, communities needs so they're uh, active members of the community that engage with the community bring some information back to the sheriff's department so we can work with the community members and I think let me add some clarity to that because Ash and I had a discussion about this um, a cab member appointed on the Public Safety Commission as a Public Safety Commissioner is no different than a commissioner appointed by the council so you have seven commissioners the difference just is that those two cab members were appointed by the station captain which you know unbeknownst to me have to also be appointed by the council so you have to ratify that those nominations the captain and his staff bring the perspective of the station as our contracted law enforcement to that public safety commission that's their role their job and so those two members while they serve on the Public Safety Commission, they have the benefit of serving in discussions that are broader from the San Dimas Station that may include some things that are happening in Azusa or Covina in the unincorporated area that may come up. But in essence, because the decisions being made that the appointees from CAB to come to our commission are also going to be San Dimas residents, there really isn't a distinction. Those two members are just like anybody else as residents in terms of how they serve. They don't bring any specialized knowledge that is not being brought by the sheriff's staff that are at those commissions or anything else other than they have a super interest in public safety as they serve in one, not just one body, but now two. But I guess, so just so we're all clear, the CAC or CAB members are not representatives of the sheriff's department when they are sitting in the public safety commission they should not be so they're not proxies for the captain or his staff they should not be speaking for the station i would be asking the captain himself to speak for the station okay so then what so but they're appointed by virtue of the captain for the purposes of a body that the sheriff's department has to advise the station and the captain, right? As I think was just read, correct? No, nominated, and then we correct. we approve. C correct. Well, no, 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 no. Because yes. regardless of San Dimas, they're still going to serve for ca for the captain, correct? Regardless of what we would do with these people, let's say San Dimas didn't recognize the the cab members or what have you the sheriff station still is gonna have a civilian advisory council or board, correct? Correct. This, your decision on the public safety doesn't impact CAB, the formation and operation of CAB at the station. Right, because it serves a function to the captain for the purposes of advising him and or her to what's going on in the community, correct? Correct. So what happened in history where San Dimas recognized the sheriff's department's member sheriff's department's cab members as members of the public safety commission what caused that to occur i don't have the history that some maybe council members do but i believe it related to the formation of the san Dimas station itself as serving our community instead of being integrated with the city of walnut <laughs> okay thank well, you the bottom line is it's a nomination but like all the nominations in history that Emmett and I and everybody else can remember, the council usually does not turn down a nomination wh wherever it comes from. So whether it's been the committee of two or the sheriff's captain or however it's been done, there's a nomination and the council then sees that nomination. So those members of CAP have been on agendas for confirmation or approval by this body. And it's pretty perfunctory all the time. And so that's because, you know, obviously, and just in the idea that I was proposing, just as we respect the captain and his, his nominations, and so we say, oh, okay, great. The idea would be that we would be respecting Scott and the chair of those two commissions, their ideas on who would be not, they would be nominating. And so, now we don't have, and then again, we don't have to approve them. And we say, oh, okay, you guys got to come up with somebody else. So I, I guess my, my intent when I was asking about what the roles of the CAC members are wasn't, wasn't anything more than kind of clarifying in my own mind 
that they serve a different role than public safety commissioners. And I know that we had thrown around the idea previously, and I, th I let me preface this by saying I think it's really important that the CAC members be at the Public Safety Commission meetings to provide their insight, and because obviously they have a unique role and, uh, and a unique perspective that I think is valuable to the Public Safety Commission itself as it deliberates on topics, but this is something that I think we've touched on previously in other meetings, um, and that's that, uh, that the CAC members, in my view, are so unique in that, in the way that they're appointed, in their role, that it seems that they're almost an accessory to the Public Safety Commission rather than being Public Safety Commission members. And I think we've even thrown around at some point that they're not voting members, but that uh, their their attendance is, is important. So we, we did start having that conversation. Um, and I think in the end, at this moment, I think they're still voting members is the last discussion. But, you know, it lends itself to a broader discussion. Um, I appreciate the leveraging of numbers here for the purpose of this discussion. I don't agree with it. Um, and I don't agree with it because, to be totally candid, uh, with all respect to the captain and the sheriff's department, I don't agree with a contractor of the city being able to appoint to an advisory commission to the council, period. So I don't agree with the CAC members being advisory to the council when they're in fact appointed, and I love you, Captain Ash, but they're in fact appointed by a contractor to the city. And I say that with all of you knowing what I do, but the bottom line is I don't care what contractor it would be. It's not appropriate in my mind. And so I don't think, I think we should have five all across the board, there's equity. In the same way, I would not be a supporter of West Coast Arborist proposing two people to serve on the Parks and Recreation Commission. It's not appropriate. It just is not. But, but in the same way, I mean, that's kind of the conundrum that's evolved. And I understand historically where it may have made sense. And I, in fact, agree that the CAC and the cab members coming to the meetings do bring perspective because they have the opportunity to learn from the captain. And in fact, they go through more training, they get to tour the jails, they have a much deeper understanding as a resident to help the captain and our sheriff station do their job. But, you know, I'd be lying if I didn't tell you that, you know, if we were to sit there and say, hey, you know, we need X, and it was advantageous and they happen to be an appointee of a of a contractor that I don't know that that's the best thing to be totally frank. So here's what I might propose because the discussion of the commissions has um, continued longer than we thought and we do have people who want to serve and uh, this is complex. I might, I, I might suggest that that discussion along with the proposal that John has, it sounds like you, John, and the mayor have similar feelings, but just have arrived in a different place. Maybe we have like a subcommittee where you two find some sort of a resolution on the number, and then for the time being, maybe we move forward with the five so we can get the process started, given that it's July and we are looking at people to start serving uh, for the five. The addition of what happens with the cab members, and then if we do decide to move to an expansion to the other two commissions, that's more of an add-on rather than stopping the process completely. So that way we move forward with that cab as well as those other things. You and Emmett, the mayor, can work out an arrangement. Maybe we don't move forward at all with anything, but I think that might help delve into these okay, details. Okay. Because this is this is complicated stuff. I don't think that if we continue this for another hour, we're going to arrive at a decision. Sure. That sounds good to me. I, I think that what we can do is on that issue, on the issue about the term zero, because I think that's coming, that's just come up. And so I think the terms, we should make the appointments like you're saying, and they start September 1st. They are for two-year terms, and there's provisos for removing, as we said. But uh, before we get to that point, we should be able to come back with some suggestions. And Emmett and I would probably want a staff member to help us out. Maybe Chris, we could be with you or something about some of the, or your designee. But um, I would be willing to vote for the handbook 
in that case. Five zero. And I, what's that? Five zero. We might get to five zero on this one. And then that's fine with me. I, I do. So what our discussion on that is going to be about if we had seven members, how would we do it? And yeah, how, how do we get there? Okay. And, I, and I'm not guarantee I'm going to vote for, I'm not going to guarantee that I'm going to vote for seven, but I want to hear how we get there and how we resolve some of the issues yeah. to, to getting there. So, so in my mind, it's three things, right? So it's the first is which commissions should have seven members, which includes the Public Safety Commission. From there, then it would be, um, so you have, you have that. And then the second would be how are those people appointed if you do decide to go to a larger number? And then finally, the last thing is, is would those two, two extra, would they serve terms that look different or would their positions be different um, with respect to the other five? I think that if you come to some sort of agreement or maybe you don't arrive at all and then we just have, we have kind of the default left, but I just don't know if we continue this, we put it off another meeting. I don't know if we'll, if we'll arrive at, a, at some sort of an answer um, without well, this stretching on a long time. There's, there, you know, there is a belief amongst people that go, just a general belief, that people, when they're involved, want to be a part of that decision-making factor. They might come to the meeting and sit there, but when it comes time to vote and they have to sit off to the bat, they don't feel like their words have been heard or nothing. So I think that if we're going to look at seven, if there's going to be a conversation, they would have to be voting type members. Sure, but as I said, I don't know if we're going to arrive at that I, at I this don't need, council I don't, meeting, I don't so I think either, it might be worth just taking it offline because I, I can see this going on for yeah, a really long time. Well, Two people working on this might be Respectfully, I appreciate the subcommittee, but frankly, I would only agree to that in the event that the subcommittee either came back with a unified recommendation or nothing at all. No independent proposals. And if we can't get to that, then the council as a whole then should sit down and commit another Saturday to go through this exercise. Move this forward tonight for all the reasons you've discussed, and then we can all sit here and go through this because I suspect, and I know having talked to the mayor about this at length, there's a lot of issues related to this. And part of this gets into five, the reason five makes sense is because it's equal across this board right here. But for the same reasons of getting into how we appoint, how we select, which was really the, the basis of all of this discussion to begin with is how we got to where this was and we all committed all this time so i think to uh propose seven is you know a little bit uh we already we already had this discussion on a saturday when we went through this number so so your proposal well i mean good point but the uh direction we gave staff at that was tentative we didn't vote on a handbook we didn't vote on that we didn't vote on that and you know i stated at that time that um, I thought that the number should be different than just five for some commissions. So, um, so I mean, I, I guess, I mean, my alternative is to vote against it and it will pass and that's, that's just how things go. But I like the idea of sitting down with Emmett. If we can't come to some recommendation, maybe we'll come to recommendation on some things and not on others. I like the idea of sitting down again with the whole council and hashing it out. Just uh, That sounds like a better option. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. If, if I may, sounds like the council wants to go the direction of the staff recommendation. There's a, and there was a number of changes that were proposed to that staff recommendation. So if that's the direction we want to go, I just want to make sure I clarify what's on the table on the action the council's taking. All right, anybody else have anything you want to ask about? Is everybody acceptable to a uh, two-man uh, ad hoc committee to come back and be prepared by next meeting? I'm opposed. Okay. I think we should do a study session of the full council to further this discussion on science. I'm not opposed to that at all. I'm not but opposed it, to that either. That's, that's I'm, I'm fine with that as well. Okay. I, don't think, I don't think it's necessary, but I understand it. So. All right. So... The way I look at it is, like, if, if I left myself out, it's one, two, three, what do you want to do? My preference would be a smaller group. I just think it's more productive than, but 
Did you see how the resolution for the Floyd incident happened? We had a subcommittee, it came back completely different. And in fact, the committee couldn't reach a consensus and independent proposals were proposed. I have little to no faith based off of history that this will be productive as a subcommittee, which is why I think the study session will be more effective. Well, thank you for your confidence. You got it. <laughs> I don't, well, I guess I would just say Being that. totally frank. Sa so. Sample size, sample I, I, size of one. I right? like the two-step. I, I like having and, the subcommittee, uh, and if the subcommittee can't agree, then... Yeah, so, I, you know, and, and that was a very emotionally charged issue that we're talking about commissions, um, which I don't think are as emotionally charged as that. So I think it's I also think proven otherwise <laughs> the past few meetings. All right, well, yeah, it's taken over a year. Me, this is pretty emotional. I don't know how the vote's going to go, but I, <laughs> having, having just listened to what I heard, and I think I heard, uh, I'm going to vote for, for this to have a five-person study session and open it up to the commissions. People want to come and listen and figure out what they want to do, that's fine with me. All, all study sessions are open to the public. I think this meeting was open to the public, and I don't know how many commissions actually received notification about this meeting tonight, but I actually see three members of commissions here tonight, but I don't see any other commission, and I know that Scott Wasserman sent out a email earlier this week that invited everyone to be here to speak and hear what was going on and I don't know that that got out but I don't know if that went got to the senior commission and I it, don't know uh, who, I, who, who it all went to. All the commissioners received notification of this meeting every, along, all, all, along all, with all, the materials. All okay that's good. Yes. But, all right so um, somebody want to suggest what a, a proposal on a, on a uh, study session? Um, I'm going to be out of town at the next meeting, so it, I'd prefer it to be another meeting besides that one. I think it's definitely a Saturday. This is and nothing's going to get done with this in two hours. So I just know us. So. Okay. So what did you say? A Saturday, some point. Right. Date uncertain. John, when are you going to be back in town? Uh, July, August first, second, something like that. August 1st? 1st or 2nd, in time for the birthday barbecue, let's put it that way. Okay, that's I'm right good after, with right February of 24. Okay. Uh, Chris, Chris, look, my, my question is, uh, and then forgot what it was, how long would it take you to be prepared to get a location and, and put this thing up together? And if we do it then and we come up with some type of resolution, can you still be ready to go with the commissions being in place by September 1. Well, Mayor, I thought we were going to pass this tonight as proposed, right. and then the study session mm -hmm. is going to follow, okay. right? Yeah. Yeah. So, we'll, we, yeah, there's going to be five members on each commission anyway, I mean, or at least. Yeah. So, at least Maybe we will get go, done in time. We I can doubt move we forward. Will. If I yeah, can get a motion. At, I would prefer a study set. It's not going to take all day on Saturday. It's, yep. But. <laughs> okay, we're going to come back to the study session, study session after, yeah. after this vote. Okay, as long as it's a study session doesn't have a specific date in it. So uh, if I were to make a motion to move forward with the staff's uh, recommendation uh, and also a study session to follow at a date uncertain? Um, we can do that. There's just two typos I want to acknowledge. The Planning Commission will be Thursday instead of Tuesday and we're removing an extra word of opportunities under history. But yeah. with, okay. with those changes? Yes. And yes. Do I have a second? Wait, did you make the motion? Yes. Is there going to be a substitute motion lingering around here? No. Okay, second. Any further discussion? Substitute motions. We have a couple more hours before the day night's <laughs> over. Yeah. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Can I just ask clarity on the study session? You know You're you would. You're not asking for Saturday study session. You're asking for a study session, so it could be during the week, correct? I recommend happy hour, but that's me. Yeah, I'm good with a happy yeah, hour. Yeah. I'm fine with that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, <laughs> I, I'm going to put it to you. I'll put it to you this way. I don't want to be here all day. And I know this took literally an all day thing to get to where we're at. And it was specifically this discussion. This discussion, I mean, yeah, we passed five now. So we're really just going to talk about two, adding two perhaps. But the issue is going to be how you appoint those two, and that's going to be a substantive discussion. I don't think we're going to do it in two hours because there's issues of equity and all the other things that go into it. But, uh, but hey, whatever you think, I'll just be ticked if I waste two hours because we know we can't get it done. 
Well, just think, if nothing passes, then it stays the way it is. Who, anybody else wishing to have it on a Saturday morning? I love seeing you on Saturday, Emmett. I'm uh, I'm willing to dedicate it a Saturday, dedicate a Saturday to it. Um, I, I also have other days of the week open, um, so whatever works for the council. But I do tend to agree that uh, historically, as we've talked about these issues, they've gone longer than we've expected, and I would just hate to schedule a meeting to then kick the can down the road again. So. All right. Well, we saw what happened the last time we tried to have a Saturday meeting. How many? How long it actually took us? So. Um, Let's, let's, I, I'm, I'm acceptable with a Saturday, but I, I don't want to do it at Christmas time. I want to do it soon because I think people want to know what they're doing and they're looking at us as being pretty unstable. <laughs> so. uh, uh, well, I'll ask the clerk to send out and poll on dates and we'll set aside four hours. We'll look at both the weekend and weekdays to see if there's an option and see what works best for everybody. I know I said this earlier, I think we've created a, a, we're, we're a group looking for a problem to try to solve that there is no problem. So, all right, motion carries 5-0. Okay, we'll move forward. And you'll get back to us and let us know what Saturday is available after you poll everybody. Correct. Thank you. Oh, this year is only going to last about two hours. Okay. Uh, analysis for consideration of review and direction for transferring the review authority and duties from the development plan review board to the planning commission. Henry. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, good evening, Honorable Mayor, members of the City Council. Um, just to refresh uh, everyone's memory, um, at the February 4th City Council study session that was just mentioned uh, to review the Boards and Commission Handbook, the City Council requested analysis regarding the possibility of transferring the duties and review authority uh, from the Development uh, Plan Review Board, or DPRB, to the Planning Commission. Uh, therefore, at the uh, March 14th City Council study session, staff presented to the City Council um, the state and local requirements regarding the planning commission roles and responsibilities uh, the history of how and why the dprb was created and discussed how the city staff created a staff only development review committee in 2020 in an effort to improve and streamline uh, the review process of uh, planning entitlement applications additionally at the march 14th study session staff provided an analysis of pros and cons uh, of transferring the functions of the re review authority to, of DPRB to Planning Commission, and the pros included um, an extra layer of review authority, uh, additional meeting for public to provide comments. Uh, some of the cons included creating a, it created a bifurcated review process, uh, lengthened the entitlement process, um, can create a conflict for the DPRB Planning Commission member and the planning commission not functioning um, as it was intended. Um, lastly, on March 14th, City Council directed staff uh, to research other surrounding jurisdictions regarding a um, architectural review boards and to provide the City Council with their findings. So therefore, staff is presenting City Council with the findings of this research. Um, staff contacted 11 jurisdictions that included Pasadena, Whittier, uh, Claremont, Duarte, Monrovia, Rancho Cucamonga, Glendora, Laverne, Walnut, Arcadia, and Covina. Of these uh, jurisdictions, three had City Council only appointed members of the public, which included Pasadena, Whittier, and Claremont. Three had staff only boards. Um, Duarte has a public member on the um, ARB, but at this time, according to their staff, they have not filled that position um, because it was difficult to find a member of the public that met their qualifications um, and that the public member typically lengthened the review process so they have not um, uh, appointed one of those or filled that position. Uh, the other two jurisdictions were Monrovia and Rancho Cucamonga and five cities uh, do not have an ARB which 
includes uh, Glendora, Laverne, Walnut, Arcadia, and Covina. So all those uh, cities, the projects only go to Planning Commission. Um, so the City Council appointed ARBs varied and consisted between five and nine members. Uh, that some of the members have to have certain architecture or design review related qualifications and they must reside in the city. Uh, their review authority varied, uh, but mainly dealing with larger residential and non-residential projects. They all met twice a month. Uh, two of the three jurisdictions, uh, the third one um, that's not included is passing in. Uh, their staff mentioned that it was difficult to find qualified residents uh, to fill these uh, positions. Uh, one, of the, one of the benefits that the staff did discuss is that it provided an extra buffer between the staff and the applicant. Uh, the st uh, staff member ARBs uh, vary between three and five members uh, with varying review authority. They also met twice a month. Uh, for the most part, uh, these jurisdictions felt that the ARB um, and planning commission processes were beneficial, even if it lengthened the process. Uh, but Rancho Cucamonga also felt that it was redundant uh, when the entitlement required planning commission approval because um, they have two members on, of planning commission on the ARB um, and one staff member. Um, Excuse so me, Henry. When, when, you're, when you're talking, you're talking ARB, you're talking the same thing as our development plan review? Uh, the architect, architectural review okay, so board. The, we, we call it development, development plan, plan review board. Cool. So what is, the pro what is our proper name for it? Development Plan Review Board? Development Plan Review Board, okay, correct. So and ARB is, uh, Architectural Review Board um, is kind of more of a, uh, they have different names. It's just, this is what uh, the uh, council wanted us to research. So I just kind of lumped it in as um, Architectural Review Committee, but they, they have some different names as well, but it's pretty much the same function. Okay. Um, so currently, I just wanted to mention that, uh, as I previously mentioned, we do have a staff-only uh, development review committee, a DRC, um, that was um, instituted in 2020, and it currently operates similar uh, to the staff member ARBs, um, but it doesn't lengthen the hearings or entitlement uh, timelines. Uh, lastly, um, I wanted to bring to the City Council's attention that uh, Senate Bill 330 and SB 8 created the Housing Crisis Act of 2019. Uh, these bills defined a housing development project as a project that proposes um, either all residential units, um, a mixed-use development with at least two-thirds of the square footage uh, being for residential uses or transitional supportive or emergency housing. Uh, additionally, these bills um, state that a project can only be reviewed against objective, quantifiable, written development standards, conditions, and policies. Uh, one of the more important requirements of these bills is that um, it limits residential development projects that complies with the applicable objective, general plan, and zoning standards in effect at the time an application is deemed complete to five public hearings or meetings. Um, this includes any community meeting. So if we required a community meeting outreach just to get the community inputs, that would count, or any study sessions. Um, so those would count as well, not just public hearings. Uh, therefore, the state has severely limited the number of meetings or hearings a qualified residential project can have prior to the city having to make a, a decision on those projects. Um, with that, staff recommends that the city council initiate a muni municipal code text amendment, eliminating and transferring the development plan review board review authority and duties to the planning commission and to make all necessary development code amendments to codify these changes and direct staff to amend the board's commission and committee's handbook that was kind of just approved uh, to align with the development code amendments. Uh, this concludes staff's presentation, but I'd also like to introduce Luz Tarico, our planning manager, who led the ARB research, and together we'd be happy to answer any questions that the city council may have. Thank you. Any questions? I had a quick question. You said that uh, 
the way that our staff review of uh, development plans goes right now is very similar to the staff only uh, review process in other cities and that the consensus was that that saved time. Is that just because uh, staff is working throughout the week and they're able to review these plans uh, at any given time that they come across their desk, vice having to schedule meetings several weeks out? Um, yes, on both accounts. So for these ARB meetings, you have to draft staff reports, notice these meetings, um, and prepare for all of that, which obviously takes time. Um, with the in-house staff only development uh, review committee that we have, it's inter internal staff um, reviews of projects. So to make sure that we're all consistent and if there's any major issues with the project, we can talk about it. And we meet every Tuesday, or we can schedule every Tuesday basically in staff. And those don't require staff reports or anything like that. We just compile all the comments and provide that information to the applicant and then after the applicant receives those comments, they can ask for a meeting and we can discuss any questions that they may have on those staff comments. And there's no staff report on that uh, meeting because I'm assuming everybody that's a part of that uh, process already knows the project pretty well. Correct, and they're reviewing it on behalf of whatever department they're representing. Okay, thanks. Is the, uh, so is that committee, Henry, is that reviewing the architectural and design details? Uh, yes, they can. Uh, mainly that's the function of the planning department. So staff typically provides a lot of guidance towards architecture, massing, obviously the setbacks and other okay. development standards. Right. Our, our existing um, DPRB uh, has a uh, Chamber of Commerce representative. How, how do we handle that, that p position? Do we... Uh, does the change going to make uh, in the code going to change it in the ordinance? Well, question to staff. Um, planning commissions in other cities, do they typically include appointees by outside bodies? It typically, they're appoint you're talking about if they're appointed okay, by... Well, it, it currently, we, the chamber has an appointee who's been there for probably 20 plus years. Correct. Okay. And I was under the imp uh, impression that it was a part of the actual ordinance that st stated that they had a, a seat at the table. Correct. Like how, how, do we, how do we resolve that seat at the table that no longer that we're cutting out? Uh, we would have to amend our development code. Right. Our municipal code to address any changes of the, the uh, commission handbook. Okay. All right. Any, any further questions? I was wondering, um, just uh, in the March 14th staff report, um, the planning staff went over the, uh, the pros and cons of a DPRB, and there were a couple pros there. Um, I was just wondering if, in the time since then, if you thought of any other, um, I mean, there, was, there was a good one about public um, input. Um, do you think that the DPRB has had a, uh, do you think that it has, outside of any kind of delay that might have taken place, do you think there's been some positive things coming out of the DPRB over the years? So since I've been here, um, the staff has, plan mainly staff, uh, planning staff, when it comes to architecture, massing, and, and those types of details has pretty much vetted uh, a finalized product before it goes before the DPRB um, it, and it streamlined our process to where there's no real back and forth uh, with DPRB and my understanding from even historically it's always been a staff driven process with regards to the architectural design the massing um, they, the DPRB might have minor tweaks when it comes to their meetings um, but the substantial project in itself is typically a um, vetted out and finalized pretty much at, at a staff level. Well, my other question, maybe it's a two-parter, but it has to do with the Housing Crisis Act. And as you were mentioning, that really prohibits subjective review of um, residential 
some residential developments. I don't. Is it every residential development, or is it mainly um, multi, you know, multifamily, it, or it would be all residential? Okay, so that's all residential, um, and then now they use that word subjective, and I know that at our study session back in, I guess it was in March, a member of the DP. PRB, the architect, stated that um, there are objective architectural standards that can be applied to a pro project. And he used the word objective architectural standards. Is there anything, such thing? Uh, I'm unaware of any of those standards. Um, I can ask our planning manager of his knowledge, but um, architecturally, currently right now, we don't. Um, but for multifamily and mixed use, we are working on an objective design standards that we'll be bringing forward at some point in the future. So in like, uh, you know, way back when, when they built uh, these apartment buildings in New York and they had like uh, air shafts basically to, you know, so that they, uh, and, and those were eventually declared unsafe or unhealthy or whatever, unhealthy probably because the, everybody had a window but it was basically looking out into this air shaft that was in the middle of the building. And I don't think those are allowed anymore by, by code. I, I don't know if they are or not. But I was just wondering, if in a case like that, um, do, do you know the code or the building code well enough to uh, say whether that's allowed? And if so, how big an air shaft would have to be? The, the building code is something separate than objective design standards from a architectural or building from a planning okay. perspective. So they would have to meet building codes, so what, whatever those standards are, and I, I'm not aware of okay. what you're asking. So I, my, my, I guess my question is, so say, and I don't, Eric left already and he's, uh, you know, he's probably on his way to Texas, but uh, <laughs> um, if, if, the, if the safety aspect of it says they've got to be 20 feet wide and 40 feet long or something like mm -hmm. that. Are we saying that somebody could come in and then propose something like that in San Dimas? And we wouldn't be able to say, oh no, they've got to be open to the front or they've got to be this or that. I mean, I'm just wondering if there are standards of any kind at all that are architectural or can somebody come in with our downtown specific plan and just build a concrete block, no color, nothing at all, put windows in it, I've got a housing development here, and we have absolutely nothing to say about it. So our downtown specific plan is creating its own objective design standards. Um, so that will have its own objective design standards, as well as what I previously mentioned, for everywhere else in the city, for any proposed multifamily or mixed use. Um, we are going to be moving forward a objective design standards that we've been, staff's been working on with a uh, consultant. Council Member, if I may, let me reframe the question. There are times that we, DPRB, others have required or, de or requested things that are not, that there are no standards related to it, like the pitching of a certain, like a parapet, and I, w I would like to see a parapet on the front, and it'll look nicer. That's fine and dandy, but it's not objective. We don't have a specific requirement that says you must have X, Y, or Z, and anybody who reads that standard can apply it consistently across the board. They're, they want to get away from the subjectivity that DPRB has had both positive and not so positive implications of decision making that they've made. Um, and I can't make a classification overall to the success because I think we have a beautiful community and the extent to which DPRB had an impact on that, I can't put my finger on exactly what that may be. But objective design standards, which we don't have a lot of, would limit things that could be put there. So if somebody builds a single family home in a single, in the way that complies fully with the code, telling them, no, these are things you need, you need to be doing to your property. Well, we need to be able to point to a specific objective criteria that is not mushy that they, they apply You're to. You're just saying it has to be an R code. It can't be in some architectural book that says, here's how you build a building. I, I think you probably could reference things. We do that on the public work side with the green book standards for development. But whatever you're pointing to has to be very clear and not subject to an interpretation, which is what the DPRB's role was. The DPRB's role was to actually make calls and kind of define the type of architectural look and feel of things that are out there. And that no longer can be that way. So the, for, 
So the HCA Housing Crisis Act states it can't be that way for residential developments. Right. But for not for everything so else. So for commercial, yeah. industrial, and mixed use where there is more than a third commercial, <laughs> the there, there we can supply or we can require a review or we can review it subjectively and say this either looks good or doesn't. Um. It, it wouldn't report. have to meet certain some of these requirements, but I think all things have to have these objective design standards, unless now, now Jeff you didn't knows mention otherwise. that in the staff report. Is that is that someplace else? The, the a commercial development would have to meet any objective design standards that are in our code, but then there's also the subjective discretion that the DPRB or the Planning Commission or the Council would have that you can uh, just come up with subjective conditions and requirements for the okay. project as yeah. well. All right. And if I may, you're, we're going to hear about this when we, in the next couple of months, hear from the final audit that comes out of development services. Where the council has discretion, where let's say somebody's requesting a rezone or a discretionary permit that is what's necessary to create the development that they want, we can exert a far larger amount of control over that development. You're not forced into rezoning changing the zoning just because a developer came and said, I want to do this. But if you're willing to do that, you can start to dictate a lot more of what you expect of that project as a condition of what you would consider to rezone that project. So there are things Same. that we can do, but I think right now we're, we've been a very young city and we've been relying on a body like DPRB to define the things that we want, the look and feel of buildings that come out. And I think we need to get to now where we have that very serious conversation in what we want the look and feel to be, and then how do you write that in an objective manner that then applies to those properties where there isn't the subjectivity that would necessitate a DPRB to be able to make the decision. All right, that's all the questions I have. All right, any further questions? Okay, I'll uh, entertain a proposal, a motion to uh, I basically do away with DPRB and, and, and uh, move them to the uh, under the purview of the Planning Commission. I'll uh, move as uh, recommended by staff. Uh, if you, if I could, uh, somebody might second that. But if you'd rather not have a substitute motion and hear my proposal instead first, then you could do the substitute motion. You're right. I could. I'll yeah. withdraw my motion. How does that sound? That okay. Sounds great. That way you can. <laughs> that, because that, one way or the other, I was going to be t talking about this. So. Um, appreciate the staff's work in um, looking at different cities with um, architectural review boards or a body like that. Um, I appreciate the work that the DPRB has done and the Planning Commission has done in their various roles and especially staff and in, in hearing about it tonight in the way that they are looking at things architecturally to make sure that they, uh, as much as they can, um, fit the look and feel of the community. I did notice that um, most cities don't have, or a majority, let's say it that way, don't have the architectural review boards. Um, so when I was looking around at some cities that I was wondering about, um, a couple that I found that did have them are La Cunada Flint Ridge with five public members, South Pasadena with five public members, and as we already heard, Pasadena has nine public members, Whittier five, Claremont seven. Um, so those cities, Pasadena, Whittier, Claremont, La Cunada, Flint Ridge, and South Pasadena, and I'll throw San Dimas in because we have a DPRB with public members. I think that those cities, including San Dimas, are exemplary and look better than the cities that don't have the ARB. And I'm not going to name any cities, but with that, those examples that I was just listing there, they're good-looking communities, especially things that are, are you now Whittier's an older community, so you've got a lot of older things, but the things they're doing new, newer as in the last 20, 30, 40 years, they've defined the way the community is. And the same with the DPRB here in San Dimas is, is my opinion. So um, I believe, so I'll speak on, on behalf of the DPRB or in favor of them. I believe we need some kind of architectural review. Um, I believe that the DPRB looks at proposals in greater detail 
They are aided by the staff, of course, and the staff does, does a lot of work. Um, I personally like more public members on the, on the Architectural Review Board. I believe that over the years they have shown that they, it is a collaborative process. There is a back and forth. Um, the applicant and the staff and the DPRB are all involved to make the project a better project. I also think that um, discussion is improved when sitting around a table. So of course the staff um, architectural review, um, but the DPRB as well. The planning commission is in a different setting. Now they could have their meetings differently, of course, around a table, but the planning commission is different and it's like this right here. So, you know, you basically have things presented to them, like you present to us, and we're reacting on that, whereas, um, as we just talked about, a study session for another matter, it's a nice idea to be sitting around a table with the applicant, with public members, and with the, um, and with the staff, obviously. Um, in my opinion, I, and I don't think there's any, any really debate about this, over the years, the DPRB has been an integral part of making San Dimas look and feel the way that it does. And, and I can just, having, I do read the minutes, and reading those minutes on the architecture and the back and forth, the projects, 90% of the time, if not more, come out better. I feel that buildings that are well-designed and attractive don't just get that way. The DPRB has been indispensable in the process, and they have been and uh, are an com important contributor to the San Dimas quality of life. What you look around and see, it hasn't just happened because of staff and the Planning Commission. Everybody has a role, but the DPRB, I think, has had, a, had, a, had an important role. So here's the compromise, and um, I, I can make this a motion. I don't know if I get any traction, but I'll tell you what my compromise is, and that's to readjust the focus of the DPRB. So first of all, I would change its name just to Architectural Review Board. And I would take all non-design responsibilities out, licenses and permits, tree removal, grading. I mean, grading, you could maybe say it's part of design, but it's basically an architectural review board. Um, focus on that kind of review, include in its mandate how proposals rate architecturally to the buildings, trees, streets, sidewalks, and neighborhoods around them. So nothing's done in isolation. Uh, and I think um, architects anyway, and I, I have a nephew who's a renowned architect. Uh, we have one in town here, and we have a few in town actually. And they will all talk about how things relate to the surrounding environment. It's not just the building itself. It's the, it's the surrounding environment. Um, as an example, I'll tell you a case where we had a letdown, and that was about 10 or so years ago. The DPRB should have had more involvement in the downtown street um, redesign. As it was, we had staff, consultant, and the city council wrangling over it. And if you were here, do you remember how long that took? That thing just took forever. And in the end, we had proposals such as the consultant saying, got three choices of trees. You have a crepe myrtle, a palm tree, or a pine tree. Downtown. Yeah, and so we chose the crepe myrtles. And, uh, you know, and then we just took crepe myrtles out of our street tree palette last week because, because so, so, you know, I just think, and, and it's not just that, but it's the whole design that is, is great in certain ways, but it could have, I think the DPRB could have been more involved. And in the future is the Benita Corridor. I'd really like the D DPRB to be involved in the, or the ARB to be involved in the buildings that are coming up in the Benita Corridor that we're gonna be having a lot of. So I would definitely retain staff representation. I'd increase the public membership to five, appoint them the same way we're appointing everybody else. Don't have city council and planning commission members on the board for the reasons that were stated in the staff report. And lastly, there should be some way to expedite the process. And I don't know how this would work, but my thought is, I don't know if you could like 
schedule the meetings weekly and then just have a meeting when you needed to. Kind of the same like now where things are, I, mean, I don't know, sometimes I see the planning commission, DPRB are canceled because there's no business, but I don't know if you could, if you would be able to just have those commissioners and staff available every week, then things could get there quicker, and if there's a redesign or a redo or anything like that, and the staff and the applicant want, they could get back in a week. So I don't know if there's any appetite for something along those lines. And the other thing, last thing I'll say is, there's not a real rush to do this. I mean, because the planning commission is going to get appointed under the commission thing, and so if you want some time to digest what I just said and talk about it a little bit, then I'm fine with with that as well. Well, being the only one who's up in uh, on this dais that has sat through years of DPRB meetings, um, a lot of that sounded really good, John, and I agree with a whole heck of a lot of it. The DPRB has done some really good work. But the reality is that DPRB has always been pushed through and mandated by the by the staff. The staff has always coordinated it completely. We had three three people that weren't on the staff that's been around there. That's Dave Bratt, Scott Dilley, John Sorsonelli, who was the architect that was always around. So it was always, there's a problem with, if you go to something like talking about a weekly meeting or something like that, all of these people that are, you know, um, if we want to continue to, to allow people to get their projects approved and moved on, I watched meetings that were, I was in meetings that you think we postpone things. They, they postpone things week after week after week and people go for, for months waiting for an approval for it to even get to the planning commission and get their suggestions in. And, uh, you know, now we're asking, we'll be looking for community members to give up their time once a week or every other week, and they go from one hour to three to four to all day. So I think you're starting to ask for more. The difference is staff is going to still guide the process, but they're going to actually be going to five commissioners that are community members, okay, one of which is, is a very well-vested architect, which will help. And they know the problems because their chair, Dave Brad, has been sitting on it for several years, and he knows where it's at. And you know, as well as I do, how many times we get cancellation notices. And, that seems, and, and that's time to somebody wanting to build a house or build a project and all of that stuff. I, everything you said, I agree with 100% except for the fact that I think we need to find a process to move forward. And you're right, you know, our, our, we have a great city. We have a beautiful city. Laverne, all of those cities have good cities, but it doesn't mean that every, you know, city that's out there that doesn't have a actual DPRB. Remember, Larry Stevens was not a real advocate of DPRB, but the council was, and that's why it stayed here for all these many years. Uh, worse, you know, it's like everything else we do around here. Um, this is a process that we could see how it works, and if it doesn't work, we're going to know right away. We're going to figure it out. And uh, I, I think it's been a lot of long time coming, and a conversation has occurred. So I'm going to be supportive of, of removing DPRB and making another part of the planning commission. And um, I, I think. Everybody has a vested interest. The Planning Commission has a vested interest to show us that this is going to work for them. The staff has a vested interest because they're the ones recommending it and brought it forward. And uh, I, I just think that the one thing that we should do, and I'm not sure how the vote's going to go, I have no idea, but I think we ought to collectively say thank you to Dave Bratt to Scott Dilley and John Sorsonelli because they have put in more hours than a lot of us have put, put into to do to and what they volunteered to do for this community. And uh, so my personal thanks to them and I would hope that's coming from the entire council. Okay, any further discussion? I'll just echo the comments of thanks. I think that when this got brought up, it was interesting um, 
you know, both from the time I got elected to uh, even in the last two years when there was some substantial discussion regarding this particular topic, um, this came to my attention from people who sit on these bodies. And, you know, we talked about how we could be more efficient and how we can look at still maintaining the high quality outcomes that we've seen in the community um, and yet streamline it in a way that we could get the best uh, and most efficient decision while not necessarily sacrificing uh, the quality. I am very grateful to everyone that served on DPRB um, for the whole time, as uh, Councilmember Nakano talked about earlier, uh, and all the time I've grown up in the city. I mean, this, this thing has really helped create um, not just the aesthetics of the community, but really smart, I think, projects um, that have been fantastic. But to that end, I also look at the dockets before uh, both the DPRB and the Planning Commission. And, you know, I always laugh because my box in the council room uh, and the council office looks like a disaster with cancellation notices sometimes um, for some of these different bodies just because of different reasons, whether there's, there's not work to do or what have you. Um, and I think it's a great opportunity to take some people that uh, do pull, um, do have a lot of expertise already sitting on some of those bodies and, and maximize them. I know it's been staff driven. Uh, I think we're going to be taking a good step in the right direction. I'm thankful for the service of everybody that served in the past. Um, and I'm very much supportive of staff's recommendation. And um, did you end up making a motion? No, I, just need, I just need to hear one more person agree with that sentiment, and I'm not going to make a motion. But if I oh. hear one person say they like it, then I'll oh. make a motion. Got it. All right. Well, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause there. Sure. No worries. Although I recently learned you can have a third motion on the table, by the way, under Rosenbl course. Rosenberg's. Yeah, so, yep. All right, so what are we doing? I'll just say this, John. Um, I think that the way you describe the Architecture Review Board is a great vision. The consensus that I've heard from staff, as well as people who are familiar with both bodies, is that they do want to try something new. Whether or not this is the right approach. I think it is an approach worth trying in terms of simplifying the process and trying to move forward with a streamlined way of quickening the pace. I think that there's a lot of elements of the board that could be incorporated. So one of them, for example, should the process be more collaborative, I think that those elements could be incorporated and change the commission I'm not sure that, I think we have to give it a shot in terms of seeing how, it, how it'll work without it. With that said, just as the mayor said, if something isn't working, we should absolutely look at this review board, setting it up again and looking at other ways. Um, I'm just not hearing the consensus right cool. now for something similar to be set up. I, I appreciate that, and I, I will not make a motion, so you're going to be able to make a motion in just a second. Um, I will say that um, the community that I mentioned with all public member boards, as well as the ones with staff, staff dri driven, but the communities with the public members are good-looking communities, and I think that's no accident. It does, so what we're saying is we're going to take the community members Additional, we're gonna have the Planning Commission, that, and that's fine. But in seeing the way, I haven't heard staff lay out how that's gonna work with the Planning Commission differently than the staff doing all the work and presenting it to the Planning Commission for discussion. That sounds like what it's gonna be. And it takes out the public architectural review sure. process, in my opinion, and I think that's, that's important for a community to have members of the public at that ground level or whatever yeah. you wanna call it. Yeah. So that's, that's one, one reason. Um, the, the other thing that w what I think all three of you have said is that, well, let's try something and see how it works. And, you know, what I was proposing was something else. Just because it's not staff's recommendation, it's something else to try and see if it works, if we're in that frame of mind. But, yeah, but as I yeah. said, I'm not going to make a motion, and, um, but, but I do think we should retain the architectural function in a separate body. The, some of the issues that were raised were just, and I, I understand you clarifying responsibilities, but there is a level of friction that exists right now that has not really 
Hmm. That's really, I think, what might be driving some of the movement toward consolidation. And so that's why I do think that it is worth giving it a shot. Um, your point about communities that are beautiful having these boards, I think there is a correlation there. I'm also not 100% completely certain that cities can't be beautiful without a board either. And so that's why I'm also willing to give it a shot. If it was very clear that you need one of these to have a city that looks a certain way, then I don't think anybody on this council would object to having something like that. I believe that there probably are a lot of cities that don't have boards that look just as nice as the cities that you mentioned. And that's why I am a little bit more willing to try something new. Um, but I do think that it's worth revisiting this in a year and seeing if the process, in fact, didn't work out quite the way people wanted it to, and if this board or another body should be instituted to put that forward. I know that's not the answer you were looking for, but it, it's just hard for me hearing some of the feedback from people who know this better than I do, and I admit I'm not an expert here at all. I just have to rely on what people tell me and what people have told me is they want to try something a little more streamlined and consolidated before they are willing to consider other options. Point well taken. I think that uh, you know some people who complain about our city staff in general, it's not just the DPRB, th there have been so many cases where you have somebody come up with the ideal design that there's their perfect project for their house or for business or for a new house or a new project, a new development, and they come to our staff, and our staff, to its credit, tells them, this is just not <laughs> going to fit the product, and it doesn't even meet the, 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 the standards that are out there and that are written down, let alone any kind of architectural um, subjectivity. And they'll, then they'll be told to go and fix it, and they don't fix it when they come back. A lot of the DPRB's friction is applicants and Believe me, I mean, the minutes, at least from the minutes, and the meetings don't last that long, things are going through. I mean, it just seems, and there are some, I don't know what it is, 10% or 15% that have to go back for some kind of revision. But they are going through. The ones that don't get through right away are people who are asking for things that our city is not inclined to approve. And so hopefully, at the staff level, that will still be the case. Um, and I, and I just, I'm sorry about the uh, lack of the public being involved in that one extra step. But uh, thanks for the discussion. But, but as I re might remind you, even our current DPRB only has three active members and anybody can come if, on any project and come in and talk just like they can come in front of us and talk about a project. You know, then believe me, there are people that come in and say, hey, I don't want that house next to my house. And, and, and so they'll have different views and stuff like that. It's just, it's, right, the current time right now, and, and I hate to use the word stale, but it is, it's a stale process. With staffs driving it, so you've got three board members to speak. At any one time, the three, three civilian board members can be outvoted. By the staff, That's why. and so it's a staff-driven society. It's my proposal. So, so now, <laughs> so, so now I have five yep. uh, planning commissioners, and it makes it a little more even. Okay. I, I think Henry can always add an extra staff member. <laughs> so, but right. The, right now it's more. So I'll, 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 we have a motion. I'll, uh, I'll just say, I'm, I like Eric's idea about revisiting this in a year and we can check in and see how it goes and look at some of the metrics behind it. If it has in fact streamlined uh, efficiency and we've seen the outcomes that we hope to see from it. I'm not in favor of what you're proposing because I don't agree with adding layers, of replacing bureaucracy with bureaucracy. And I think part of the crux of this aims to streamline efficiencies that are consistent with some of the strategic goals of the city. And so if this does not lend itself towards doing so, then and and we lose some quality in the outcomes then i think there may be merit to exploring that um at a later time but not without giving this a shot and it seems that everyone from people serving on these bodies to staff and others think this is the way to go so um with that i will no 
Uh, I'm just saying. Make a motion to approve uh, staff's recommendation as proposed. Second. And just Any further discussion? Just to clarify, this is to initiate a municipal code text amendment that we're not making the change at this moment. We still have to change the code to comp comport with what you're asking for. Get to have the same discussion later on. Saturday session. Oh yeah, that one on a Sunday, please, <laughs> in 2026. Okay, all in favor? Wait, did I get a second? Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. All, right. yeah, sorry. all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Okay, hearing a uh, motion carries for one with Councilman Ebner saying no. Okay. Well, and through this, I would hope to not see too many cancellation notices uh, of the uh, Planning Commission slash DPRB. Um, I just also want to clarify that Councilmember Vienna said that his inbox was overflowing with uh, cancellation notices. It's also overflowing with Christmas presents, too, I think. There's a train spike in there now or something, too, apparently. You know, one, one thing that Mayor Morris always talked to me about was instead of having cancellations of the Planning Commission, maybe it might be one of those things that we might try having them when their spare time looking at outdated ordinances that need to be updated. So maybe study sessions for, their, for the Planning Commission and to help them because they not all, not all have ever served on the DPRB and it could help them out. So maybe some training in that direction uh, might help them as well as us having an opportunity to update some of the ordinances that have probably been around for well, it's at least 60 years. So it's just, just uh, my thoughts. All right. Okay, we'll go to oral communications. Those who, you know, whether this, members of the audience, the speakers are limited. Or is that? Did, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> Can I go ahead? I'm just checking. Okay. Um, Speakers are limited to three minutes, as may be determined by the chair. Anyone wishing to speak to the council at this time? Seeing none, we'll, <clears throat> seeing none, we'll move. <clears throat> excuse me. Move forward to the city manager's report. Uh, briefly, uh, the last Thursday in January, in June, we held the state of the city. Thank you to you, Mr. Mayor, and to the chamber for coordinating the event. And a special thanks goes to Sweet and Savory and In-House Coffee for providing. Uh, some of the food and drink that was available there. Lastly, the council um, participated in, a, in what I think is their first joint council meeting with the city of Laverne. Um, and I'll, I'll look to the council member with the longest tenure. I think the first ever joint council meeting with the city of Laverne since 1960, our formation. Uh, I think it went really well. There was, it was attended far greater in numbers than I expected. We literally packed the house all the way to the back of the plumber building and still had standing room only after 300 chairs were put down. And so I think that was a successful meeting. Um, and that's the last of my report, Mr. Mayor. Okay, thank you. S City Attorney. <laughs> Sorry, I do apologize. There was an item that specifically is on the agenda. Uh, the council many months ago had made a request, this was in the middle of 2022, to bring forth an agenda item inviting the, our insurance joint powers authority to come and make a presentation on our claims process and to walk through certain claims. Uh, this was soon after council member Nakano was um, elected to the council and these are items that come in pretty frequently claim denials that come forth um, since then council Nakano has been able to go through uh, the specific seminar and conference training through cjpia uh, i've talked to council member Nakano about is there still a need to do this specific item which would be a closed session item he is okay not having that agenda item but i wanted to make sure the council was okay not having the item before i remove it from our planning calendar that's fine with me. Okay, thank you. So we will remove that. Okay, thank, thank you. you. City Attorney. Uh, no reports tonight, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Members of the City Council, Council members reports on meetings attended at the expense of the local agency. 
Hearing none, Council, City Council request for future items, comments. Councilman Nakano. No future items or comments at this time. Thank you. Councilman Vienna. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'll just be brief. Um, last Thursday, I think it was, um, the City Council had that joint meeting uh, with Laverne. I just wanted to say thank you to all the members of the public uh, that came out to that meeting. Uh, it was a very interesting meeting and I am very happy um, that everyone that raised their voice uh, so that everyone heard uh, from the community. And I'm also thankful to the developer National Corps for coming and uh, speaking with uh, the community and both councils. Uh, I also want to say thank you to uh, Supervisor Catherine Barger, who was in attendance um, and listened uh, rather intently, I think, to the members of the community. And uh, I'm hopeful that uh, somehow, some way, um, you know, this will all work out uh, for the best interest of, of all communities, I hope. Um, that being said, I hope everybody had uh, a nice 4th of July. Um, it was a very interesting um you know watching social media posts and what have you but you know there are fireworks still going off in my neighborhood uh, up and around the uh, northern uh, foothill area and m80s and what have you so to whoever those folks are uh if you, if you know who they are or what have you um you know please encourage your your youth or whoever's doing it um, to reconsider uh, it's very disturbing I think and I've gotten phone calls from people um, you know and and I hear about it you know if you see if you're on ring on the neighbor's app you get the you know hey gunshots or you know whatever and it, you know there's so many things in our community that could happen uh, transformers explode and and other things that m80s just add a whole nother or whatever it is you know fireworks at a whole nother level of confusion so um needless to say our fire department and everyone else and our law enforcement has enough to do um so um <laughs> we don't we prohibit it uh safe and sane or, or any of that in our community so please uh refrain and with that said um i wanted to say Give a shout out to the sheriff station. Um, they have the Boosters Car Show, I think is this Sunday. Is that correct? Yeah, this Sunday uh, over here in Civic Center. Uh, so that'll be a really cool event. Uh, I look forward to uh, stopping by and see it every year. That's a great event that brings out a, a lot of really cool cars um, from the community. And um, it's a really good event to support our boosters who help support our sheriff's station. Uh, so with that, uh, I just wanted to say thank you also to staff. Um, I think the city, you know, it's always interesting. We get mid-year, especially after budget and everything else, and you really take some stock in what's going on. Um, and people are happy here. And especially, and like I said last meeting, I don't know if it's just because the sun's coming out and people are out and getting their vitamins and what have you, but people really do enjoy living here. And, uh, and I think Eric, uh, you know, talked a lot about that being able to live and work in a community is, is awesome. And uh, I want to thank you all for that. And again, I just want to thank Eric for his years of service here in the community. Uh, he will be missed and, uh, have a good weekend. Thank you, John. I have nothing further. Thanks. Thank you. Eric. In addition to everything that uh, Ryan talked about in relation to that meeting on Thursday, I just wanted to say thank you to our staff who hosted. Uh, it was a large crowd and required, I'm sure, a lot of setup and teardown. So I want to, and it went late into the night too. So you guys stayed even later. So I just want to say thank you for all that. That's it. Thank you. I believe the meeting went very well. I know that I've heard from the. Uh, Mayor and, and the city manager of uh, and most of their council people from Laverne who thanked us for at least hosting them at, at our location. And uh, I do also want to thank uh, Supervisor Barger. I don't think anyone who attended that meeting or had a chance to watch it on uh, Channel 3 has any doubt of where her thoughts are and where, how she supports this community. And, and she was very, very outspoken. Uh, to National Corps about, you know, the communications that's been lacking. And uh, I do want to thank her very much. And let's hope that it works in a direction that uh, we can deal with. Uh, I, too, want to remind people about the car show. Uh, there's been a lot of work going into it. The sheriff's uh, 
Booster Club has uh, spent lots and lots of hours along with the volunteers and deputies from the sheriff's station. Uh, it's going to be uh, on the 16th from 9 a.m. to 2.30 p.m. Uh, there's going to be uh, a bus there, to, not to ride, but just to look at. <laughs> there's going to be a, quite a few things. The other thing that most people or a lot of people don't know about is every Wednesday night for an over an eight-week period of time, we have the farmer's market here, and uh, they have music in the park. Uh, the farmer's market has just been overwhelmed with people. It is like one of the biggest things every Wednesday night here, and it's amazing to see Community Park completely full of people and they're sitting there having a good time listening to music, and it goes from 7 o'clock to 9 o'clock, but we have people sitting up there at 4.30, 5 o'clock in the afternoon having picnics and barbecues, well, no barbecues, picnics, and they're buying corn and stuff from the, from the farmer's market. But uh, those are things that we need to do. Okay, this time we'll uh, be adjourning to go into a, uh, a closed session. Mayor, uh, we have one more item. Oh, I'm sorry. We need to appoint a, victim, uh, um, a, a delegate to the Cal City's uh, 2023 uh, annual conference and expo. Um, do I have a volunteer? Yeah, I typically do that, um, so I, I will do it. That's in Sacramento? Yeah, with uh, the alternate being uh, who's the victim, I mean, uh, member of staff coming with us. I think that's going to be Chris. The alternate uh, be designated the city manager. I, I'm planning to attend as well, just to say. Okay. All right. Uh, hey. Well, you could be the alternate then. Are you going? Either yeah. way, I don't, it doesn't matter. Yeah, I'll be there, but. Okay. Well, who's all planning on going, or do we know by now? Yeah, I'm, I'm planning to go. John's going. Okay. I hear Sacramento is beautiful this time of the year. <laughs> All right. If you haven't, if you haven't uh, contacted Deborah, please do that post haste, so that she can get you a reservation. Actually, I would. If you do plan to go, yeah. You want to be the delegate? I, I could be the delegate. I don't mind. All right. I would move then, John and the alternate, Chris. You just have fun. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. John's now going to be That's the fine. delegate. Second. And John's now going to be the delegate. Second. And Chris, you'll be the alternate. Okay. All right. Now we'll adjourn and go off into a closed session uh, with a contract. Jeff, you want to say anything? I was just going to say we should have a vote on that appointment. A vote on that appointment? For the delegate, yes. Uh, well, uh, somebody give me a motion. I would move that uh, Council Member Ebner is the delegate with the alternate being the city manager or his uh, designee. Second. Any, any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Hearing none, John, you're the delegate. Motion carries 5 0. We need that electric bus.